Welcome back, everyone, to the Bourbon and BS podcast. This is episode 116. If you guys are watching live on uh, YouTube or Facebook Live, you guys see the special guests already. We have Rocky Patel himself in the bottom of the screen, which uh, Rocky, welcome to the Bourbon and BS podcast. Great to be here. I wish everybody's being safe and healthy out there and uh, proud to be on this show with you, Steve. No, it's, it, it's a pleasure. It's a pleasure. And then returning guest also from Rocky Patel Cigars up in your top right corner. Second on the screen, number one in your hearts, we have Rob Wilson. And he is posted up in his, his Rocky Patel studio that looks a little bit familiar. He's in a garage as well. Yeah, absolutely. No. Rob, welcome back. Thanks, Steve. I appreciate you having me. It's a, obviously always a pleasure to be here with you. And uh, I'm looking forward to having the boss man here to hang out and have some good conversation. We, I can't hear him. You can't hear him? Oh. No. Rob, if you want to come back on one more time, maybe. Let's do that. I think right. he's, got that, he's got that bass voice. He's just blowing up the mic. He'll, he'll be back on here. So, um, But I want to thank, while we wait for him to come back on here, I've got, uh, I want to thank our sponsors. So Tinderbox at Easton, uh, we want to thank Tinderbox at Easton. They are uh, sponsoring us with the uh, featured cigar, which is the uh, Rocky Patel LB1. And that's going to be the one we're going to smoke in part one. And then we're also going to be smoking a second cigar, maybe more, but uh, the uh, special edition here, which is going to be something that is tougher to find, but we're happy to have it here. And I'm going to rearrange the squares here for a sec. And also, Altidus USA, thank you guys for uh, doing everything you're doing for us. Altidus USA is sponsoring us for this year again, which we appreciate. We've got, uh, I've got a, a Upman Hispaniola in the garage as well. They always uh, feature a second cigar unless we have special guests like Rocky and Rob on here. They have no problem, obviously, smoking the featured guest cigar, which is fantastic. So thank you to Altidus as well for all the support. And then BS Cigar Company, we have gold and silver also available right now for shipping. When we talk about Tinderbox at Easton, we'll get right into some of the things. Having Rocky on here gives us a little bit extra privilege. So what we've done this week and until supplies uh, run out, but contact Easton Tinderbox at Tinder or Easton Tinderbox at gmail.com. And we have a Rocky Patel stay at home special this week. And this is a seven pack of, of uh, cigars and it's going to be 30% off. So retails a little over $70 and this is going to be $49.95 plus shipping and tax. This is an amazing deal. It's already flying out. We did a special, what we call Tasty Tuesday, but we put it on Sunday. So Rob and I did a Tasty Tuesday on Sunday. And the last few days, we've already sold several of these, and they're flying out the door. So don't wait on that. It's a fantastic sampler. It includes the LB1. It includes the special edition, along with five other Rocky Patel premium cigars. And then also, we are going to be doing the box special that we would have done when Rocky had committed to come out to Columbus, Ohio back in March, right, as this was all going down. And so if you want to get a box of the LB1 or the special edition, we will give you a 20% off. That's a shared discount from Rocky Patel and Tinderbox at Easton. But there's going to be a 20% off the box of either of those cigars. So contact us again, Easton Tinderbox at gmail.com. It's fantastic special. So, and again, thank you guys for being here. Thanks for having us. Great to be here. You know, um, I think things are changing around the world every day. Um, I know that we have to make the best of our time uh, for us cigar lovers, especially in the evening. No right. better time to spark up a great cigar, enjoy a nice cocktail. I know today I've got the monkey shoulder with me. That's our featured drink. That's I'm excited it. about it. It was my choice, so here it is. Just we all got a bottle here. After uh, working out hard today and a busy day, I'm looking forward to relaxing with everybody. Yeah, you said you did three workouts today. Most people are talking about how they can't get one workout in it with all the COVID stuff going on because their gyms are closed. They can't get workout equipment. And then you tell me that you're doing three workouts a day, or at least today. You guys there? Yeah, can you hear us? We right. might have. Sorry, issue. I had an incoming call. Lost you for a while. All right, can you hear us there? Oh, I better log back in. All right, oh, sorry, sorry. he's got a busy yeah. phone there. So, uh, Rob, are you getting your workouts in right now? 
Uh, actually, I am. I am. I uh, been, uh, you know, I was doing my P90 for a while there, but uh, had a little bit of a, a back flare up in my older age. And uh, but I, I, I've kept pretty strict with uh, some good cardio. You know, still get my push ups in and and that kind of thing. So you know, it's it's one of those things. You know, being a rep and living on the road as we do. You know, it's funny how you know, being home this many days consecutively, how, how it just changes things. I'm used to um, basically grazing, you know, that's, that's right. diet. You know, I, I stop and grab, you know, this or that. And I'm always looking for those healthier options. Sorry but, about that, Steve. I guess that's what happens when people call in. I don't know. Yeah, I'm not sure either. Like Can you hear us okay? I hear you fine. I hear you fine. So, yeah, we we're talking about the workout. I know, uh, listen, we've had plenty of free time. Uh, there's not a lot going out, you know, our office is on, uh, staggered hours. We've got the shipping department coming real early in the morning. We have the accounting team come in a little later and then the executive comes in, uh, after one o'clock. So my mornings are quite free and, uh, there's not a whole lot of work going on right now. So, uh, yeah, I got a workout in early morning. Uh, then I went for an 18 mile bike ride and then I got another one, uh, in at five. So um, just trying to make up for all those hours on the road, drinking scotch and smoking cigars and having to eat red meat. So just trying to take advantage of uh, this downtime. Now you're telling me you're, 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 are you tell me you're not eating red meat, drinking scotch and, and smoking cigars? Well, I'm doing all of the above. But okay. <laughs> it's, it's, it's all about balance, really, is the key is what's going on is what you're telling it me. Is. I have been cooking up a storm. I mean, yeah. believe it or not, yesterday I made this Mario Batali recipe with uh, bolognese sauce from scratch. Uh, uh, then I actually made some uh, uh, dumplings, uh, you know, Chinese dumplings. Uh, uh, then after that, I, I, I made a Persian dish uh, stew with gourmet sabzi, and then I made some Korean barbecue. And then I finally closed up with making some uh, sh uh, some shredded chicken tacos uh, but with a really cool recipe. So I've been playing around with food, just cooking up a storm. There's nothing else to do in the evening. You can't go anywhere. You can't do anything. So I might as well cook and uh, I enjoy it. That's absolutely right. Yeah, we've, we've fired up our grill quite a bit. We've got a, um, a bourbon and BS community page that just passed a thousand members. And I, you know, I made the choice about two weeks ago to post a picture of what, what I was grilling with a cigar and whiskey. And now all of a sudden everyone else is doing the same thing. And, and everyone's getting ideas from each other, which is fantastic. So, and and I got Ed Paxton out there from Woodlands Cigar. <laughs> he just he just posted, "Damn it, I'm hungry." So, I mean, just just talking about the grilling out and what you are you're doing out there, uh, and everyone else, it's it's great to see everyone kind of come together, even though it's all remote. Talking about that, but you know, I want to I want to jump in for part one. Either one, of you, Rocky, if you want to talk a bit, because on on when we did the the Tasty Tuesday on Sunday this week. Rob was able to share a bit about the LB1, but the LB1 is a, a newer addition to the line, and and it's something that, according to Rob, and I have no doubt that this thing is is flying right now. This, I mean, obviously with the, the COVID nineteen situation, things have slowed down all over the country. But you know, going into it, and then with uh, people that have been taking advantage of that that special at Tinderbox at Easton, the thing is just it's a powerhouse already. It is. I mean, look, look at the beautiful, shiny, oily wrapper on this cigar. You know, it's a beautiful Habano wrapper from Ecuador. Uh, it's like the sixth priming, so it's really high up on the tobacco plant. It's got a ton of flavor, very rich, but oily. Then we've got uh, fillers from our own farms in Esteli, Nicaragua, and Condega, Nicaragua. And then finally, it's got one leaf of Hamastron from Honduras, so it brings in that sweetness. Yeah. Uh, I would say it's a medium plus cigar, a very complex with a ton of flavor, some lingering sweetness, very well balanced. Uh, yeah, this cigar is doing very well for us. So we talked about it again on the, uh, the on the on the Tinderbox uh, sponsor page there, LB One. So I'm not going to tell you what Rob said about that because I, I want to see if you you say the same thing when you talk about like Rocky Patel cigars. Obviously, packaging you know, cigars are first, right? It's just like the whiskeys, right? It's what's in the bottle that really, really matters, right? You can you can you can dress up a pig, but it's still a pig, right? So with Rocky Patel cigars, you guys are well known for the 
the just not I don't want to say fancy, but just just really elegant and and some bold packaging, some some really cool names. They all have meanings, and there's always thought behind it. And then you guys come out swinging with this fantastic cigar, and it says LB One, and everyone's asking retailers. They're talking about it online, and they're like. All right, so LB, what does the L stand for? What does the B stand for? And why one? So, honestly, at my old age, uh, you know, I'm running out of uh, thinking power to come up with any more names. And so the last two releases we had, uh, we struggled with a good name. Yeah. And uh, so we, we decided to use the original factory code. In fact, the box says on it, original factory code. That's LB1. So... Basically, when we make blends, we'll make anywhere from like 75 to 100, 120 different blends. And this is a process that takes over two years uh, to make a blend. You know, we'll work with it, then we'll tweak it, we'll change the primings, we'll change the binder. You wait three months, the cigar is going to change over time. You might play with it again. So anyway, this was the original blend out of the 120 blends that everybody liked. And so we just used a factory code called LB1. We did that with the number six that we came out with. It was blend number six uh, out of the 80-some blends that we had there. So, yeah, it's the original factory code. And then we, we decided to make something, do something exciting. We actually have the tobacco plant. And then every leaf on that tobacco plant is kind of described on the cover of the box. And it talks of which farm, which specific farm in Esteli, in Condega, in Hamistran that the tobacco came from. And it's got a diagram of the plant. It shows you where on that plant that tobacco leaf came from and what specific farm it came from, the name of the farm. So that's kind of cool too. Yeah, I mean, there's a level of transparency there, right? I mean, clearly you're, you're doing this and and uh, I kind of like that about it because even though you obviously put the Rocky Patel cigars spin on the the band and make it elegant, you, you have it pop, you've got a, a very attractive complimentary band to the, the 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 shade wrapper here but there's a level of transparency there you know it's 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 almost raw in my opinion which i like that yeah. because it's it's a different approach i feel like for rocky patel cigars and with you because everything you 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 know you're doing these days with the cigars and everything else the honesty you have where you're just like honestly i couldn't come up with any ideas this this time around as far as some some fancy you know name and something with a big story so we're just going to make it about the tobacco which i absolutely love and, and, you know, in the last few years, we've decided to go back to the basics. There's so many people that have had the opportunity to visit our farms in Honduras and Nicaragua, to visit both factories there. We take about 1,000 people a year and, and actually take them to the farm, the curing, the nursery, the fermentation, construction, um, you know, our villa. And, and a lot of them have been to many of the farms that are actually uh, uh, detailed out on, on the top of the box. And so we decided to get back a little more back to the basics um, of tobacco, of cigars, how they're made. Um, you know, recently, uh, about two and a half years ago, we built a humidor adjacent to the factory that holds over two million cigars. And one of the things we're starting to do now is actually make some of these great blends with some of these really old age tobaccos that we have that now that we have our own farms in, in several different regions in Nicaragua, uh, we have the opportunity uh, that to have bought a lot of age wrappers and we're sitting on 30 to $35 million uh, of age tobaccos uh, that have already been fermented uh, that have been in the pilones and now are just aging. And so we decided to make limited edition batches of these cigars and put them away for 18 months, put them away for two years. Uh, that's what we did when we released, um, you know, the second edition of the Age Limited and Rare. The, the, the whole purpose there is age, it's limited, and it's rare. We only made a 1,000 boxes of each size. We literally aged the cigar for up to two years, uh, and then we released it, and uh, it was a big home run. And now we're celebrating our 25th year in the cigar business. I thought I was a young guy. Now I'm getting to be one of the older guys in the business. So we're actually coming out. We were supposed to release a cigar, and we plan on releasing it this year, this July, uh, at the trade show called The Quarter Century. Again, that's another great blend with aged tobaccos. And we took that cigar, and we 
aged it for it's been already now 19 20 months uh sitting in the humidor so uh, you know it, it's fun to go back to, to the basics and, and do special projects uh where we can actually just come up with really really cool stuff uh that that has a lot of age uh with it well i like you know we got a tyler jones saying you know he's talking about you're bringing up the the quarter of a century you know you're talking about 25 years and you, you talk about you know you think you're a young guy it's interesting to look back because it absolutely, and that's part of the things we're going to talk about in the second part of this this episode. But you know, he's sitting here saying the LB One right now is fighting the fifteenth anniversary for his favorite Rocky cigar, and that's ten years ago. Yep. <laughs> like yeah, these, these blends, that. yeah, these blends that you guys, you know, you, you name and that are on like that that list behind Rob there, and uh, there's still these powerhouses that are selling. It's like it's hard to believe that's that's ten years ago, the twentieth feels like it just came out to me at least i don't know how it feels to you i mean you guys are are churning through this stuff but when you talk about the 20th anniversary or the decade i mean it's still selling like crazy and they're they're solid blends they're they stand up to the test of time but i can't believe you're 25 years into it i know it seems uh not so long ago and and you know the last three or four years it seems like we haven't had the eye on the ball because we've been so busy fighting all this FDA regulation. So right. I was, I've been spending over 50% of my time in Washington, D.C. I certainly would like to have taken that time and spent it more down at the factories and working on stuff. And luckily, we're surrounded with great people uh, who are doing that for us. But, you know, that monkey on our back, uh, you know, um, it really could wipe out almost 70% of the entire industry from the manufacturers to the retailers to the growers all of it you know it, it the 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 rules are so overreaching they're so egregious they're so burdensome uh they would be impossible to comply it would turn into de facto prohibition and that's why it's so important that we can win this battle and i'm cautiously optimistic uh, optimistic that we're getting there good good that's that's a, it's a big fight that you know everyone's in and, and you are obviously spearheading a big part of it which which we all appreciate everyone out there and I think, you know, with, with things going on in the world today, it's, it's, I think more and more people are paying attention to what is being changed behind the scenes on certain things that they're interested in. A lot of times, like cigars included, most of the time it's after the fact that the, by the time it gets to the consumer level, you've got the, the, the thing where you're like, wait, when did this happen? Why, why is this happening? And you're like, this has been talked about. This has been voted on. This is something that, you know, in the industry that you're, whatever it is, cigars or otherwise, that this is something that's been worked on behind the scenes that the information's out there, but it's usually way too late by the time the consumer says, well, I want to, I want to buy this cigar. I want to do this. And they're like, no, you can't anymore. That, that changed a year ago. And they're like, well, how? Yeah. I mean, listen, we, if the FDA had its way, there would be no new cigar lens allowed on the market after February of 2007. Right. Uh, they didn't want us to introduce any new products in the marketplace. And, uh, it's a shame because this market has completely changed. Consumers are looking for those new blends. They're looking for those cool new cigars from all the different manufacturers, you know. And then if we have to go with constituent testing and chemical testing and all this stuff, at the end of the day, these rules were really made for cigarette companies because cigarette right. companies were manipulating the tobacco. Uh, they were adding things to the tobacco to make them more addictive. Well, premium cigar makers just don't do that. And so they came up with these standards that work for the cigarette industry to make every cigarette exactly the same. Well, they're made by machines, and hence you can make them exactly the same. Well, premium hand rolled cigars are made by hand, and each manufacturer, whether it's myself or Fuente or Padron or whoever it is, intends to make their cigars with their unique style, with their unique character. They ferment the tobacco differently. They cure the tobacco differently. And even from roller to roller, it's impossible to make the cigar exactly the same. The buncher can't control like a machine exactly per millimeter, uh, you know, the weight of the cigars. You can't control per millimeter the ring gauge of the cigar. So uh, the whole thing is a fallacy. Uh, you know, like I've always said, the, the FDA just that did not take the time to investigate and learn our industry. It's the equivalent of sending a plumber to fix the rocket on the space shuttle. That's about how much knowledge they had about our industry. Uh, and, and, and it's a sad thing. So luckily, uh, we filed some lawsuits. The big case that we won two months ago was the warning stickers. 
They wanted 30 to 40 percent of these boxes covered with warning stickers that say they cause cancer. And the judge basically ruled and said that the FDA has not provided any scientific evidence, not shown any evidence. To the contrary, we showed them that there's no youth access issues. Kids are not smoking cigars and there's no real, uh, you know, help problem to the, to the public at large. And, and so that was a great win for us. And then finally, he said, uh, from a First Amendment perspective, we have the right to be able to express on our boxes, you know, the vintages of the tobacco, the ages of tobacco, in the case of families like Padron and Fuente, the legacy of their family, right. all these things, much like a wine bottle does. Uh, you can express uh, the First Amendment freedom of speech to talk about the products you're selling. So that was a great win. And now we have another lawsuit that's coming up for a hearing around June 24th. And we're hopeful that deals with all this constituent testing and and substantial equivalents and all of yeah. that. And we're hopeful we can win there. And if we can't, uh, you know, we, we made some great inroads with the Trump administration, uh, with senior cabinet members there. Uh, right after Christmas, I was there at least for three or four weeks in a row. And, you know, they set up a task force because they're concerned about the 300,000 jobs in Honduras and Nicaragua and Dominican and the immigration issues that could result from it. They're concerned about retail shops like the Tinderbox that have a legacy that serve their community. And, and you know, 2,500 retail shops like that, that matter, uh, you know, and, and they're concerned about the 80 to 90 manufacturers that are in business that employ all these people. So it's an industry, it's a cottage industry that would actually be just wiped out. And so I'm hopeful that, uh, you know, cooler minds will prevail and we'll get over this. No, I think wiped out is, is obviously it's, it's not an exaggeration. I mean, that's, that's definitely a powerful statement. And I, you know, a lot of industries go through it, but I mean, what you're talking about is absolutely right. And I, I appreciate you sharing all that stuff because a lot of people don't know what's going on, especially, you know, from the, the cigar guys, it looks like you just got another call, so hopefully you can hear us still. Um, can you hear us still, Rocky? Maybe you can't. Um, Rob, if – yeah, Rocky, if you need to log back on, I can't hear you. So, Rob, what do you think of of this LB1? I mean, we, we, we highlighted a lot of this stuff here, but what do you think of the LB1 as far as, you know, because we talked about it the other day – and and I know I'm a fan, but I mean, what do you, what what do you when you you're smoking this when you're repping the brand and everything else? How does this fall into the portfolio? Uh, well, I mean, as you were mentioning earlier, I mean, the sales of it has been exponential. I mean, right out the gates. I mean, everybody recognized quickly how great of a blend it is. And as Rocky was stating, you know, the oiliness of it, the sweetness of it. Um, you know, I, I, I talk about you know, especially since uh, you know. We've got both of our factories, you know, just pumping out stuff. The the, the things we've been doing the past years and uh, the way our portfolio has changed from what uh, people were used to in that vintage and edge lineup and how we've differentiated ourselves, you know, from that. I mean, we still obviously stand by those great blends, but with these unique blends we've been doing the past years with the LB1, you know, that Sun Grown Maduro back there, you know, the special edition that we'll have later. You know, we, we've uh, we've definitely stepped up the game. And, it's, you know, as a rep and as a fan of cigars and, uh, you know, I, I love the work that my boss does. You know, it, it's, you know, it's prideful to be able to get out there and uh, sell a great blend and also get that feedback from the consumers, you know, uh, of the blends. It's, it's nice when um, I have shops that, you know, like when this first launched, if people weren't at IPCPR or, or, or what, and they're calling me within, you know, weeks of release of, wow, okay, we need to get this in. People people are asking me for this on a daily. It, you know, it, it's it's one of those things. I mean, it, it's it's prideful when, you know, Rocky and, and Nish and Nimish and, and, and the gang – you know, when, when they put that heart and soul in this blend and to put something out there that's different and it's recognized and it makes our job as our jobs as reps that much easier, you know, because you, yeah. you stand by this great product. And then on a personal level, I love it. I, I, I'm a Habano rapper guy and I, I say it all the time. It's of all 
cigars, it's one of my favorite finishes of a cigar that I've ever had. It, the, the nice, oily, sweet finish on this is, is beautiful. And I got to say, Rocky, now that you're back with us, a uh, good pick on the uh, scotch here. This monkey shoulder pairs beautifully with this cigar. I still can't hear him. Can you hear him, Rob? I can't hear Rocky. <laughs> Something going on with the connection down there, Rocky. We cannot hear you there. So sometimes we do have this, and we love this platform, but uh, there might be a setting on there. But uh, with uh, people using phones and laptops and everything else, you know, it's it's tough. And that's part of this whole thing we're in right now. And, you know, while Rocky tries to, to log back on, we, we've taken for granted, I think, we talked about technology on a few episodes back, and I think we've taken for granted a little bit how everything should work seamlessly, and everyone is streaming right now. Everyone is doing this kind of thing. And no matter what platform you're on, I, I've had issues on, Streamyard on Google Hangouts on on Zoom on on all of these things, and it's it's interesting to me that hopefully you know as as we get back to getting out and and seeing people that still people connect this way and and the the servers won't be overloaded. We don't take it for granted. I was talking Rocky, if you can hear me, can you hear us now? Yeah, I still can't hear him. You want to yeah, you want to send him a text and see if he can uh, hit a setting or something? Yeah. I'm working on that. All right. Well, I'll talk about the LB1 a little bit here. Um, and, and so for me, I'm with you, Rob. The 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 Habano wrapper on here, the the tobacco, as Rocky described, is is absolutely for for the price point too. I mean, you're under ten dollars MSRP on this, correct? Absolutely. So to, to have a cigar like this with the transparency of the blend, with the transparency of of with the packaging and everything else, the the, the LB1 name. It's just something that I do like when when Rocky says back to the basics. I think that this is something that absolutely um, hits a a price point and a a part of the portfolio that is just just kind of in the, like you have the edge. You've got the ALRs. You've got the decades, the vintage line. You got all that stuff, and then you've got like the number six. You guys are adding something where I think a lot of people didn't realize that there was something missing. You know, it right. it, it, it was something that you have a complete portfolio. And it's something that, you know, you guys are every year you're trying to to not necessarily beef up the portfolio, but give people that whole, you know, as, as Rocky was talking about with the um, the FDA stuff. I mean, you're still trying to introduce new things. I mean, you've got all these tobaccos aging and you, you're, you've got all these blends. He's talking about 80, 100, you know, all these different blends when you're looking at this stuff. And you do. You run out of names. You don't even realize where is this going to fit in the portfolio, right? You know, it's like you've got already. How do you know how many cigar blends to put you on the spot, or at least ballpark it that that Rocky Patel Cigars has right now in the portfolio? I want to say it is roughly forty-two. Forty-two. So yeah. when you've got when you've got thirty, forty blends, it, and you're going to add one. I mean, if you don't take something away, which I know you guys have done before. Right. Uh, whether you run out of tobacco, whether it's something that, you know, just, you know, you don't want to necessarily keep in the portfolio for whatever reason. But again, finding a, a hole in there to try to say, hey, we're not going to just reproduce this. And these, these two taste really similar. Right. It, I mean, how how do you how do you when you're selling it, at least since Rocky is is still not logged back on? I mean, how do you how do you talk about that stuff? Because, I mean, it's hard to represent 10 blends, let, let alone 40 <laughs> blends. <laughs> Absolutely. I mean. But that's the job of, you know, certain cigars always work in certain places. You know, you know that. I mean, the consumer base at a specific lounge, you know, in that community, you know, it, it's always fun and, and interesting why, you know, this blend will work here. And then you go, you know, a half hour down the road to this other place. And this cigar that sells amazingly at this one spot won't sell at all at the other spot. So. Yeah. You know, I mean, obviously, as a rep, I mean, it's it's fun to go in and you know and talk about all the blends and this and that. But it's where we look to the the shop, you know, the, the managers, the owners, uh, the workers, and try to you know get that vibe for you know what's going to work for your crowd. You know, and, that, and that's the most important thing because you know the the, the personableness of the cigar. Yeah, you know? I mean. If, if, if you get people who are just coming in, you know, and, and are new cigar smokers all the time because it's a great foot traffic type of location. And, you know, obviously Connecticut's are going to sell like crazy. 
if you've got that that uh, you know small town neighborhood shop where you know it's a select group of uh, smokers and they've all been smoking forever and you know they're all that that you know medium to full bodied guy you know it, it, it's again that different demographic and uh, and just trying to figure out what what works with that crowd. We got a lot of options. Rocky, can we hear you now? I still can't hear him. I don't, is there a setting on there for a microphone? We had you no problem earlier. You got to love technology when we're trying to do this remotely. Right. But he's, he's hitting the mic there. And for you guys, stand by if you're doing this, uh, you know, watching this live. Yeah, I, I can see you talking. I can't hear you. I don't know what's going on with that. Can you hear us, Rocky? Shake your head up and down if you can hear us. He can hear us. Yeah. I don't know if he's got a laptop or a, um, an iPad or something. We could try maybe. Yeah, we st we still can't hear you. One minute. Yeah. Yeah, one minute. So while while he tries to to get back on, Bobby Hirschman says Z Z Z. Yeah. Well, we can't restart the whole thing, Ryan. So <laughs> it, 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 that's not going to help. We had Rocky, no problem. So. I do have some people commenting in. Again, this technology has worked for us since we've been on the lockdown and everything else. But let's talk a little bit about, um, and, and then hopefully he can chime in at that point. But let's talk about the monkey shoulder. So, Rob, you've never had this before. And, and I know we've done some different things over the last several weeks. But, you know, with the Bourbon and BS podcast, we like to do mostly bourbons, right? Different whiskeys and different bourbons and stuff like that, mostly on the American side. But, you know, a couple weeks ago when we had Alan Rubin on from Alec Bradley Cigars, we we did do a Glenfiddich 15. So, you know, it seems as though some of these guys that have been in the cigar game for quite some time, there is a little bit of that age old that, you know, the, the, the scotches seem to pair up with cigars. I think before the bourbon boom, uh, yeah. this was the standard, right? I mean, this was the standard here as far as doing yeah. things with cigars. It was whiskey, but a lot of it was the, the scotches, some Irish, but a lot of it was the, the scotches. So um, this one's interesting because, we talked about it and we'll bring hopefully when 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 Rocky gets back on with some audio, he he likes the Johnnies. He likes Johnny Double Black was the one that is is kind of his daily drinker when he's out and about, when he's at a burn lounge and all that stuff. Um he 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 likes to uh to drink that Johnny Johnny Walker black double black. Yeah, yeah, yes, he does. So when when Rob was talking to Rocky and he said, you know, well, what else can we do besides that? Or or he was talking about some, you know, definitely Glenn Fittick, the 12 or something. Right. The monkey shoulder, which I've had before, and I think it's good. It's interesting because it's coming from William Grant, which we talked about a bit on the on the Back to the Basics uh, episode with Alec Bradley, with Alec, you know, Alec Bradley rep, uh, Ryan Ponis, and also Alan Rubin, the owner of that. Um, this one is coming from uh, William Grant, and it's interesting because it's coming from three different distilleries that they own. One of which is is typically known for doing mostly just the malts for other other whiskeys. So, I mean, it's, it's, it's got Balvini, it's got Glenfiddich, and then I'm going to say this wrong, but Ken Nevi. Um, and these are all going to be first fill ex bourbon cast. So they're, they're using these, you know, basically straight from the bourbon world, which we've talked about on the podcast before, where this is something that, you know, all of these are coming over because with bourbons, you're going to have those virgin oak barrels. And so these oak barrels are then going to get over to these distilleries. Everything in here is all coming from those those first fills. So it's very interesting to me that when you talk about blended ones, I think one of the reasons why this one's been popular is because at the price point of in that 30 to $35 range, typically, at least in Ohio, it's 33, you've got this blended malt scotch whiskey, but it's from pretty you know high-end, reputable, different scotch whiskeys. And it's all from the space side area. And uh, you've got some, some, some reputable companies at least from the the, the barrels, um, what what are you thinking about this, Rob? Uh, I'm actually enjoying it quite a bit. I am certainly more of a typical bourbon drinker. Um, so uh, actually, Rocky himself, when I was hanging out with Rocky uh, for the Burn Indianapolis Grand Opening, he had me drinking the Johnnies, and uh, I started started enjoying uh, those um, quite a bit as well, and. Uh, yeah, I've been expanding my palate, but this is nice. It's smooth. Um, definitely a lot of uh, sweetness. I, I, like I was telling you earlier, you know, there's a nice caramel kind of yeah. to it that I enjoy. Um, 
and yeah, again, it, it pairs very well with the cigar. So yeah, definitely a fan. This bottle will uh, be taken care of. <laughs> yeah, I think it probably won't last is what's going to happen there. They say on here, and I'm, I'm watching for Rocky to come back on here. Hopefully we can get the technical difficulties on his end figured out. But So it says on there, batch 27. If you're looking at the bottle there, I know you got it kind of pointed at the camera there. But batch 27, apparently they use uh, 27 casks at a time for this, which is where that, that number comes from. So okay. you know, they're doing this in, in 27 uh, casks as far as that goes. And they, they call it smooth and rich. I wouldn't disagree with them. I think it's it's very interesting that, you know, these things are the way that they blend that and, and coming up with that, just like with the cigar side, people wonder. And I'd love to have someone from that, you know, that that company to come on here, you know, from William Grant, uh, even if it's just a rep or whatever it is. But I'd love to talk to them about how does something like this come to fruition? You know, where, where do you say, all right, now we're going to take this this barrel and this barrel and this barrel, and we're just going to start mixing it in different, you know, allocations as far as that goes. And that's the cool thing about, you know, uh, the scotches and bourbons and that kind of, you know, um, process, you know, and how it relates so beautifully to cigars, you know, they're picking this barrel and that barrel and this barrel, like, you know, Rocky's picking, you know, this priming and, you know, that leaf and, you know, this region and, and same, you know, the same kind of merriment. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so the name, and and it's interesting. Did you read anything on the bottle when before you cracked it, or you just cracked it and started drinking? Yeah, I opened and started drinking. I feel like that was the case. They talked <laughs> about this, and they, they actually put it right there on the bottle. I'm gonna read this here. It's a, a malt man's skill is demonstrated as he he turns the malting barley by hand years ago. Some malt men would develop a strain injury known as monkey shoulder. He said, thankfully, the condition no longer exists. Either we have medical better medical. Um, <laughs> advancements here or the processes have uh, actually changed but it's uh it's it, I, I like the story of it i like the story of this this whiskey it's 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 something that uh is different and now let's see if we got rocky back on here can we hear you rocky can you hear us rocky i feel like we can hear him he may not be able to hear us now <laughs> this is going very beautifully yeah, I'm, I'm sending. Can you guys hear me now? We can hear you. Can you hear us? Shit. Yes, Rocky. we can hear you. Yes, can you hear me? We can hear, can you. hear you. You can hear us? Yes. Can you hear me? No? You can't hear us? I can't hear Steve. Yeah. Oh, now he can, he can hear me, but he can't hear you. <laughs> Perfect, yeah. You got to love, like I said, you got to love technology. I'm unmute myself i don't know if you can hear me now. Just try to send that to me by email the link absolutely oh, let me see all right well we can hear you yeah i mean and that's what people want to hear is rocky they don't need to hear me obviously rob <laughs> <laughs> um so with the monkey shoulder you know you're a bourbon guy rob while you're, you're doing this and see if we can get everyone back on here um but i, I gotta say with with this and the lb1 i think it pairs nicely would you agree, Rob? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. No, uh, I'm enjoying it quite a bit. It goes down smooth. And and, and Doug Ruffalo out there, he he says uh, you know, it's a hey, blend Clay, come here. That, that that drinks like a, a single malt. To, uh, I was on this show and they can't hear. Me. I just muted him while he's figuring that out here. <laughs> Clay's there to help him. Yeah. Who's that? Clay with La Polina cigars. Oh, fantastic. Fantastic. Well, hopefully we can hear him here soon. Well, I can hear him. Hopefully he can uh, he can do that. And, I'll, and, and Nate says, just let Rob and Rocky talk for the next two hours. That, that's fine. I, I'll, I'll take a back seat for the conversation. I feel like that's not a problem with uh, the two of you guys going back and forth. Um, if you guys have any questions out there, uh, and, and Rocky, just give us a nod when you can hear us or you can hear me. Um, but uh if you guys have any questions for Rob or Rocky, hopefully we'll get the technical difficulties on, on Rocky figured out. Appreciate everyone sticking with us. And if you're listening to the audio, we're trying to keep it going. Obviously, a lot of people are trying to, to get on here. Let me see here. He's got a different feed here. Can you hear us now? I can hear you. All right. We, we got, we, you got two feeds going. Oh, okay, I got now we're good. <laughs> hey, at least we got audio. Maybe, maybe too much of it here. Okay. 
Let me remove that one from the. Uh, here we go. Kick from the studio. All right. All right. All right. All right. I think I got it. Is that good? Uh, okay. Is that good? I can hear you. Can you hear me? I can hear you. I can hear you all. All right. Wow. Sorry about that. I'm not technology savvy. And I was on my iPhone, and every time I kept getting a call, I got cut off, and I couldn't log back on with voice. So that's not anyway, a problem. I was starting to say. I was starting to say the luxury that the reason we've been able to, you know, uh, have these great new blends now is being 25 years in the business, we've had the opportunity to really get and collect old wrappers. And now that we've been farming for eight, nine years to really get tobaccos that we've been aging and curing for a long time. So now you compound that with making cigars and then allowing them to age for 12, 16, 18 months, two years. That makes a significant difference in all the new products we're coming out with new cigars. Well, Rocky, I asked Rob when you were, when you were off the air there is, um, something that we were talking about with the monkey shoulder, what they're talking about doing, you know, that where they come up with, you know, this says batch 27 on there. And that, that means they do 27 casks in, 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 at a time for this. And I was saying, you know, it's, it's, it's interesting. Like how do they start that process where they take, all right, from three different distilleries, we're going to just start mixing things. And you, you're talking about 80 blends for the number six or 80 ish blends. You got a hundred plus blends for the, the LB one. It, it, it's, where do you start? That's what people are asking is, is that, you know, where do you start on that? Are you just constantly always working on different recipes and just seeing, you know, where do you hit and then when do you name it? How do you do all that stuff? I mean, you've got a portfolio. Rob was saying it's in the ballpark of 40 some blends. And then you, you, you also have to look at the side of it. We were talking about that you, you have like your edge line. You've got some other lines. You've got the vintage line, you've got the decades and the 15th, you've got the anniversary lines, you've got now the the limited lines, and then you, you got all these blends. I mean, it's just got to be overwhelming. Where do you say, all right, this is the blend and this is where it fits in the portfolio, which is expansive? Yeah, I mean, it's difficult. Look, like a good chef, when you have a lot of different ingredients, you can really make some great recipes, right? And we're always searching to get unique tobaccos from different parts of the world. So for example, The Edge, when we made that cigar, 50% of the filler is from Panama. Nobody, <laughs> nobody in the world used tobacco from Panama. So we're always searching for different seed varietals. We're looking for different farms, different primings, how we ferment the tobaccos. And then the combination of making those blends and usually starts with a wrapper. And then we'll play around with the different fillers from around the world play around with different binders, then we'll change the fillers, we'll change the binder, we'll change the primings on the tobacco plant, you know, how low, high, high, uh, how high do you go on the plant? And so it's a combination of that plus fermentation that makes a big difference. And and it takes a long time, a year and a half, two years to come out these blends. And you'll go through 120, 130 blends out of which you might like two, maybe three. And then we'll tweak those and work with those. So it's a process. And when we come out with something that we really like, that's unusual, that's distinguishable, that's different than anything we've made, well, then we want to bring it to the market. We never actually go out with a product and say, let's introduce a product in the market because it's medium to full body. Let's introduce a product to hit a certain price point. We just try to make great tasting, unique, different cigars. And then when we hit on it and we go, wow, you know, I like it. And then I'll give it to my brother. I'll give it to Adam in the office. I'll give it to Marissa at the factory. A few key people, Hamlet, with people that have a great palate and will try it. Sometimes we disagree on the blends, but eventually I'm the one who makes that decision. And we don't think about what the market likes. It's really something I believe that I've got a pretty decent palate and I really make cigars for my palate. And then we introduce it to the marketplace or what we like as a team. And it's not about going, well, this is what the consumer is going to like. A lot of manufacturers make cigars and send them up to Cigar Aficionado and then see what they like. No, we never do that. You know, we're, we're, we're just making it because we think it's an exceptional cigar. It's unique. It's different. And then we just release it. And when you're making so many different blends and constantly working on stuff, constantly, like today I smoked three new blends that we've been working on for a long time. And uh, it's unbelievable. And then we got... 
the quarter century. We've never smoked that. It's been under lock and key for like 22 months now. And I finally had 25 cigars sent from lock and key. And I just smoked one today at 2.30 in the afternoon. And my brother smoked one. We just sat there and going, wow, this is damn good. Yeah. So we hadn't had the opportunity to smoke that for a year and a half. It was just sitting there. So, you know, you never know how the cigar is going to evolve. And it turned out amazing. So we're, we're constantly working on it, working on new stuff, pushing the envelope, trying cool stuff. So that's basically the concept of uh, our philosophy. Let me ask you this as a follow up on that. When you're talking about the 22 months, you know, under lock and key and, and it's sitting there, is it a little bit like the, the whiskey world where at, at times you, you know, like they'll, they'll kind of the, get the, the juice right out of the barrel as it's aging just to see how it's sitting, how it's, how is it doing? Do you guys do that? Do you like grab one at like, say, 15, 18 months or is it just all sitting there and no one's actually sampling how it's aging? So the ones that are aged for like six months, eight months. Yeah, we'll constantly be trying those three months out, four months out, five months out. But this project that has been 18 to 24 months, we literally did not try the cigars after six months. The last time we tried a cigar was six months and it was good. And we said, just let's let it go. It's such a good blend. It's got to age well. And I I literally smoked my first one today at 2.30 um, yeah. after it's been there 22 months. And we're going to release it in, in, in two months. And, and the reason we brought them up is we wanted to make sure they fit the new boxes. That's the reason that we, we brought them up because we're working on all the packaging. We want to make sure that the cigar evolves and changes in dimension too after it's sure. sitting this that long we want to make sure that they're going to fit the thousands of boxes that we're making uh, the last thing you want to make is two three thousand boxes and then also the cigars too big for the boxes and you go to go to a 19 count you know, box instead of 20 count box and put a block in or something right. so uh, that's one of the reasons we got it which i've heard not with this one but it's funny uh there's that that story with uh padron right that uh, they used to put a block in there and they, they had 24 cigars in a box and then they they figured out that the, the cost of cedar was rising so much that on certain blends, it costs more to for them to put a block of cedar and they put another cigar in there. I doubt that's the case with your 25th anniversary, but you obviously want it to be full circle. I mean, it's interesting because, you know, you don't think of it. You don't, you know, everyone, like most consumers, they don't think of it because when they see it on the shelf, it all just makes sense. But on your guys' end, it's it's start to finish. But I mean, you're talking about the packaging. It, you're absolutely right. I mean, it's, it's something that, you have to have that that treetop level mentality that every little piece falls into place. I do have a couple of questions here while we're talking cigars and blending with Rocky. Got Ryan Newman. He is a manager at uh, Royale Cigar Lounge. And uh, he says, out of all the tobaccos that Rocky has accessible, are there any new hybrids that you enjoy blending with as of recently? Because that's obviously part of the rage right now in the last several years that there's some hybrid seeds. Yeah, so, you know, um, obviously we're working constantly on different hybrid seed varietals uh, because what happens, we don't use pesticides in the farms. And so to avoid things like black shank, blue mold, any type of disease that can affect an entire farm, we're working on seed varietals and mutating them so that they're more resistant to any sort of infection or, or disease. And so, you know, there has been a crossbreed right now between Havana 2000 and uh, the Corojo seed. Mm -hmm. uh, there's been another uh, uh, hybrid between the Habano seed um, and uh, uh, some of the Sumatra seeds. Uh, you know, sometimes they're better, sometimes they're worse. I know the Sumatra seed right now that's being grown in Ecuador is not the same Sumatra seed that we had about seven, eight, nine, ten years ago. It's not as good in flavor, even though it's more resilient to the bugs. But this new Corojo seed is quite exciting that, that we're hybriding with the, the Havana 2000. Nice. So we might see that in the future. Yep. I mean, remember, when, when you grow these crops, they're not going to come into production in a cigar for at least six to eight years. Right. And that's young. Because, you know, it takes three to four years for the higher primings to ferment. Then you want to age the tobacco at least for two years. So you're already talking five, six years uh, before you can start making the cigar. And then you make the cigar and then it's got to age again for another six to eight months. So uh, typically, uh, you know, for our, for us at least, once we get a crop, we don't touch it for six years. Yeah. So 
Let, let's switch gears since you you were uh, you were off the air for a little bit about that. We were talking about the monkey shoulder. We I said that uh, when Rob and I were first talking about this uh, more recently, and we were talking about what whiskey to drink. Johnny Double Black is is kind of your go to on a on a daily sipper. Whether you're out and about, if you're at a burn lounge, if you're you get you know at the house and you're you're just you know tried and true. This is your this is your your staple. This is like a cup of coffee for people. You know what I mean? Yeah, um, it's almost uh, more than a cup of coffee. I don't drink coffee, but yeah, Johnny Black's the drink I drink when I'm drinking. You know, when I need to throw down six, <laughs> eight, or ten of them. Uh, you know, with ice and water over like six, seven hours, uh, that doesn't hurt me as bad. You know how it's gonna treat uh, if you. I'm drinking single malts. Typically, I'm drinking them with uh, an ice cube, and you're drinking them straight. Uh, that can hurt you pretty quickly over a five, six-hour run. So I, I try to mix them with a lot of water and lots of ice. And Johnny Black is is my medicine, uh, you know, uh, on the weekends. I feel I feel like everyone has their their go-to because, and everyone has on the flip side of that, they have that drink that they they don't go to because it's treated them poorly. <laughs> I, I feel I feel like tequila gets a bad rap. I feel like Jaeger gets a bad rap as people grow up. They always have that one tequila story that they can't drink it, even though I think it gets blamed a lot of times because tequila shots come out at the end of the night after you've been drinking whiskey. That's at least my personal experience. But we're talking about monkey shoulder coming from hanging out with Nish Patel. <laughs> There's a lot of Nish Patel, not quite Nish Patel, but there's a lot of those niches out there that are drinking buddies that'll 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 get you. They 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 know they're they're at a certain level. They see you at a certain level, and all of a sudden they're like, "Hey, uh, they just walk over with shots. They don't even ask you. They just put it in front of you." So, um, with Monkey Shoulder Rocky, what do you, what do you like about it? I mean, obviously there's a cool story about it. There's a uniqueness about it. Uh, yeah, I mean, so it's typically um, you know I got to put my glasses on here, but you know that's. That's not what we typically call a scotch, right? So this is, even though it says blended malt scotch whiskey, uh, where is it actually made? Uh, William Grant, so it is made in Scotland. So it's a blend. It I, think, I, I think it's, you know, I'm not a big fan of bourbons. So for example, bourbons are too sweet for me. Sure. We were actually working on launching our own bourbon. Uh, the rye, I think in it, uh, just, there's something about it. I, I can drink an uh, American bourbon. It's just too sweet. And I've tried them all from, you can name them. We, we, we brought everything from Angel's Envy to all the top end bourbons. And I mean, I can appreciate them, but I'm not a fan of it. The monkey shoulder uh, tastes like a mix between a Highland and it, it, it just has a little bit of an edge of an, it doesn't have the peat of an Eiley. Uh, but you know, it, it, it has a little bit, a, a hint of bourbon characteristic to it. So, uh, you know, uh, it's not as sweet as yeah. even a regular Johnny Walker and, and the Highlands are very, very smooth and, and creamy almost, I would say. Uh, but I, I think the monkey shoulders got that little bit of, uh, edge to it that I like about it. Well, we were talking about it, it comes from uh, the the distillery is all from William Grant. So you got Glenn Fittick, you have Balvinian, and a third one that's used to basically it was built on the Balfin Balvinian grounds in the '90s, and and then it it normally makes the malt for other blends, right? So they they utilize these three three distilleries in the space side area. William Grant, like you mentioned, owns all of them, and uh, they definitely they I, I agree with you. It's 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 not as sweet. It's got just a hint of it, but it's not overpowering. Right. And you know when when Rob cracked the bottle before we started. And he was asking me questions he's like, so, and he's kind of hesitant because he's a bourbon guy. Right. So he's hesitant because I mean, tell, tell him, Rob, I mean, you were you're like, is it, is it Petey? Petey? Yeah. You know, I, I was always a bourbon guy and then never drank much scotch. And a few scotches that I had tried early were all heavy and peaty, and it, it turned me off right away. So people would, for me, just not knowing people would offer scotch. I'm like, nah, I, I, nah, I, I'm not a scotch guy. I'm not a scotch guy. Uh, but actually Rocky hanging out with you and drinking some Johnny's with you <laughs> is what made me start realizing that. Hey, yeah, actually I do like some scotches. And yeah, so typically Rob, you're right. And typically I, you know, drink a lot of, or if I'm sipping, I definitely jump right on the eyelids, the Lagavulin 16, our bags, the Lafroigs, you know, at the end of the night, when you, you, you need something to kind of give you that oomph, and that you know, you're smoking that big full-bodied cigar and you need something 
power to go with it that distinguishes from all the other scotches you've been drinking while well, the Islies do that, right? So the Highlands are a little smoother. Uh, I find a McCallum, for example, too sweet also. Uh, a lot of people love McCallum, but for me, it's too sweet. So like you pointed out, Steve, being being a space side, I think that's somewhere in between. Mm -hmm. and so, you mm -hmm. know, it, it, it has a little bit of, of, of that uh, saltiness, I should say. That, uh, okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> you know, so it, it, it's just got that little more edge than a regular Highland, uh, you know, and, and that's what's unique about it. And the price point on it is fabulous. Yeah, yeah we mentioned that as well. I mean, so in Ohio, which is a state run liquor agency, right? And so it's about $33 on the shelf in Ohio. And you go around the country, obviously everyone has different prices, but this is not one. And maybe it is because it is, it's a blended malt. And it's not a single malt. It, it keeps that price down and the way that William Grant's distributing it. I think that this is one that has shown up, you know, at a lot of cigar shops, a lot of cigar lounges, a lot of bars, cigar bars. And and it's something that if you haven't had it, you're a scotch guy, if you're a bourbon guy, I think it is a transitional whiskey for people to try, What no matter what you like. Because some people, I, we had a couple of comments on there that it drinks like a single malt. We've got a bourbon drinker, you know, myself and then Rob that that's drinking it. And and it's it's really enjoyable. It's not going to be now. Again, I like with the cigar. I, I agree with you. I like the those real peaty, smoky ones to go with the cigar, especially at the end of the night. Drinking them on their own, I can't do it very often. But this is one that you could sip on. You know, it's a scotch. It's not a bourbon by any means. It's not an American whiskey. It doesn't taste like that. But it does have those characteristics that you're talking about. That I think a lot of people, if they're looking to try, if they're bourbon drinkers, they're looking to try an Irish or a Scotch. This would be one to to look at. I think I can certainly attest to that. Yeah, and it's got a great name. Right. Yeah. So do you yeah. know? I said it, Rocky, when you were not on there earlier. But um, it's all about. Do you know where that name comes from? No, please. So, so they say it on there, and I'll read it again. It's interesting. This is a it's an old injury, I guess. So it says a malt man's skill is demonstrated as he turns the malting barley by hand. And years ago, some malt men would develop a strain injury called monkey shoulder. So they're wow. doing this. And so that's where the name came from. So I mean, I, again, I love the story about it. They say it doesn't really exist anymore because I think the advancements that they've had in the industry and also with medicine. But uh, this is something that they go back and they said that this is something I guess this was a, a kind of a, a jargon word, you know, as far as that goes. You know, it's, a, it's something that in the industry people would have that, it, you know, it's like tennis elbow, right? That got named. Like, uh, I think I have a story for that. I think I do have the monkey shoulder. You got a monkey I was, shoulder I was, action? Monk like a monkey in India. And I was wrestling people. We we're playing this tackle game at two in the morning at our farm. And I was ra wrestling people, and since then I've had a monkey shoulder. <laughs> there you go. Over it, and I actually even went to an ortho for it, and I got a fifty percent tear in the uh, in the rotator cuff and the and the AC whatever they called it, the yeah. librium over here. So yeah. I've been nursing that. So yeah, I do have a monkey shoulder myself. Well, well maybe you need to sip on this a little bit. More. any still, but you know, I, I was just being stupid. I mean, they say whiskey is medicinal to some people. So there might be an opportunity that, you know, one of these nights when it's really kind of sore, you yeah. crack open some monkey shoulder and start sipping on that that night instead of Johnny. I might, I'm not saying well, I'm not a doing doctor. That, you know, we're doing that tonight. Let's see if it gets any better. That shoulder might feel real loose later. <laughs> um, going back to this. So, you know, we had a couple of questions on here, which I, I appreciate. I did have some. So, you know, you started out, if, if I'm not mistaken, mostly in Honduras. And you've, you've over the years, you branched off to Nicaragua a bit more. And you have the factory, you have farms in, in Nicaragua. Uh, we, we had a question here. I'm scrolling back to, to look at this. But it was something about, you know, what do you like about the tobacco that you grow in Nicaragua? He says just that, Tyler says, what do you like about this tobacco that you grow in Nicaragua? And I don't know if he's looking at, you know, compared to Honduras, uh, but I mean, when you branched off to Nicaragua years ago, what was it that attracted you to that? Well, I mean, Nicaragua has always been some of my favorite tobacco in the world. It just has a lot of richness to it. The soil is just black and dark and rich. Uh, it made sense to have farms that were close to our factory. Uh, you know, we had the opportunity to buy this farm that nothing had ever been grown on before. Uh, it literally sits between AJ's farm, Nestor's farm, and and, uh, and Padron's farm. I can literally wave from the, to their farms from one of the corners. And uh, uh, so we had the opportunity to grow there. Then we had an opportunity to grow in another valley called Condega, 
which mm-hmm. is about you know 20 kilometers from uh, Esteli, and 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 the tobacco is just got so much richness to it. It's got so much flavor to it. Now it can be overwhelming. The tobacco we're getting there, uh, typically the visos, which are supposed to be medium bodied, uh, are too strong and powerful like the lijeros. The lijeros are are almost too much, you know. So yeah. in a blend that I would normally use two lijeros, we have to use one. Uh, because they're almost overwhelming, but the tobacco is very, very rich. Now, having said all that, uh, I, I still love great tobacco from the Hamastran Valley in Honduras because it's got sweetness. It's got so much sweetness that it brings that sweetness in those old Cuban cigars from 10, 12 years ago, ones that were fermented and aged properly. So that combination is great. Jalapa on the other side in Nicaragua, that valley is more floral. Uh, it's got more, it doesn't have that dense, rich, full power taste as tobacco from Esteli and Condega. It's more floral. Uh, I, I also like some of the tobaccos from Costa Rica. I think it's got that very nutty quality to it. You know, uh, it's like uh, between almonds and cashews. Uh, it, it, it's, so it's different. So when you have, and again, there's, there's, there's a tobacco that we use for a uh, wrapper on our Ed cigars. Uh, we use that tobacco on, on several other blends that I don't know too many people using Costa Rican tobacco. Um, it's just no, like the Panamanian. the Panamanian is one that it's got the balance between spice and sweetness. So it's a combination of Esteli and Hamistran. So they're all so different and all so unique. And, and, you know, but I think the Nicaraguan tobacco, we probably use the most of it because if you want a rich, complex taste, you're certainly going to get that out of the valleys in Nicaragua. Absolutely. Absolutely. Rob, how about you? Are you a Nicaraguan, Honduran guy? Or are you all over the board? Where, are you, where do you find your your love as far as, you know, you've been in the industry now for how many years? Six years. Six years you've been yeah. in this industry. Yeah? Yeah, it's, uh, it's crazy to... to to think about actually <laughs> yeah but uh yeah so i mean you smoked cigars obviously before i mean we can talk a little bit about that in part two how you got into it but i mean as far as like the nicaragua honduras dominican costa rican Pan- panamanian i mean there's tobacco from all over the world but with as far as the big boys i mean where do you where do you fall as I, far I, as where your love is i'm actually right there with rocky in regards to the nicaraguan t- tobacco uh i like that sweetness that it gives i, I like that little bit of a kick when you put a up and uh yeah, I just I think the Nicaraguan tobacco is where it's at for me. Yeah, I find well, it interesting. You go from making cruise missiles to uh, selling cigars. You, I got to know you. <laughs> yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll get into that in part two a little bit more. But I got to tell well, you, it's, it's what the hell was I thinking? <laughs> yeah, right. We all fell into this uh, this industry in different ways, and it's right. it's. It's a great industry. I love it. But uh, it's funny with you talking about the different regions and the different types of tobacco and then obviously the different parts of the plant. What I find interesting, it's like, you know, Rocky, earlier on, you were talking about, you know, as you're, you're grilling and you're cooking, and you're doing all these recipes. It sounds like you're an amazing cook. And and that's fantastic to be able to, to do that, especially in this time when you're normally on the road and not being able to cook. So you have a passion for that as well. But I always find it interesting as, you know, in the retail side of it or in the cigar maker, cigar rep side of it. When you're talking to a consumer and they literally just look at you in the face, and you're like, no, nah, I don't like Honduran tobacco as they're smoking or they don't like Nicaraguan tobacco. I don't like Corojo. I don't like Criollo. I don't. And they, they tell you this just in conversation. And you look at them, you're like, what do you think of that cigar that you're smoking right now? This is fantastic. It's like a, it's like a dish. You're like, I, I don't like I don't like cilantro. I, I can't stand it. I don't like cilantro and anything and all that stuff. And Rocky just made a dish that has cilantro as one of the ingredients. And you're like, well, what do you think of that dish right there that you're eating? You're like, this is delicious. There's cilantro in that. There's Nicaraguan tobacco in that. There's that. I think it's the bigger picture. People always, you know, there's a lot of people that will will just zero in. Like, you know, I don't I don't like this brand. I don't like this this region. I don't like this this. I don't like too strong of a cigar. I'm a mild person. But what do you think of that cigar you're smoking there? This is great. Well, that's yeah, classified as a medium. So you, you hit the nail on the head. It, it's so many times when I'm visiting retail stores. Uh, and you, you talk to people and they're like, uh, yes, I don't like this tobacco. I don't like this. But you have to remember there's so many different manufacturers and they all have their own style of how they blend the cigars. And it makes a big difference what you pair up that filler with. Right. So 
if you don't like Nicaraguan filler because maybe you experienced it with a wrapper from Ecuador, a Cameroon wrapper, whatever that might be, that might be the taste profile that you didn't enjoy. It was a combination of those tobaccos. But you can take those same tobaccos in a different combination and you might enjoy it a lot. So it makes a big difference. I've had so many people tell me, oh, Rocky, I don't like your cigars. You know, I, I don't smoke them because I tried this particular one or these two particular ones. And then all of a sudden you give them vintage 99 because they're used to smoking Romeo Julieta or Macanudo and they want some, or an Ashton cabinet, they want something, or Davidoff, they want something creamy and mild. And, and obviously that makes sense. Vice versa, if somebody's smoking a tatuai, uh, you know, they want something that's got some spice, some pepper, some richness to it, some body to it. So it, it, you, you got to go out there and try. We have so many different brands. A lot of the other manufacturers have different brands. Try them, give them a shot. Don't be closed minded. You know, you might be surprised what you're going to discover. Well, I think that it's funny. I mean, Rocky, you, your brand is, is one of those as, as, as far as retailers, there's a handful out there and you know, you, you've been around now, you said for 25 years and it's interesting to me because uh, we do get that comment every once in a while about brands because they've had the one and you know, you, you recommend like, Hey, what, even the what's new guys or the you know, guys and girls that come in and like, well, what's new? And you're like, oh, I got this new Rocky Patel. And they're like, oh, I don't like Rocky. And you're like, well, uh, uh, what have you had? And they're like, they mention it. They, they mentioned just a random one or I got it online in a sampler or something like that. And I'm like, so you've had one Rocky Patel cigar. Well, he's got 40 different blends coming from all over the world, two different, uh, you know, factories. He's, you know, all this stuff. It doesn't matter. Tatuaje, you mentioned is the same thing. If they smoke the brown label and then they go to the Cabaguan and they're like, Oh, I love Tatuaje. And they light up a Cabaguan. They're like, this isn't a Tatuaje. It's like it's 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 brand identity. It's it's all this this memory that they have. But I agree with you. It's it's something that anything. I you know I grew up with uh, food allergies, so I, I I eat what I know does not bother me. And you know my girlfriend has definitely pushed me with the uh, risk. I think at times killing me, which <laughs> bothers me that she's that easy where she doesn't tell me what's in it. And, you know I've got you know no peanut. And it was originally no shellfish. I don't eat as much fish. And all of a sudden, she's like, hey, I'm cooking you salmon tonight. And I'm like, I... and she's like, just take a bite. And if, if, if it starts bothering you, then I'll make you something else. And I'm like, listen to what you're saying right now. Like, you're <laughs> you're telling me, like, bite into this. And if it if I start feeling like I need to go to the hospital, this is a risk you're willing to take right now just so that you try to broaden my horizons. When it comes to cigars and whiskey, I say try them all. And that's, you know, from retail side. Try all the brands. Try all the blends. Do not just pigeonhole yourself into mild, medium, full body. Oh, yeah. I had somebody the other day who came over for dinner, um, and she happened to be Marissa's daughter. Marissa runs a factory in Honduras, and this daughter, she's going to college here, and I invited her over for dinner, and she goes, I don't like onion and garlic. And so I said, but try these chicken tacos I made. And I literally took ground chicken, and I marinated uh not much garlic but a lot of onion uh you know quite a bit of uh red chilies jalapenos and stuff yeah. but it was four and five hours that 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 chicken was just kind of you know uh just slow cooking and, and by the time we're done and i made a taco she ended up eating four and, and, <laughs> and there, there, there was a, 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 two onions you know in a pound and a half of ground chicken but That's it was cooked for so long and all these other spices that she just didn't notice the onion that she just absolutely said i don't eat onions and so it, it, it all depends how you end up making the recipe absolutely and i think that's where it comes to and and again like whiskeys it's cigars there there is obviously the marketing side behind it but it, it comes down to the tobacco in it. and you you hit that that in the head as well it's 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 I love doing the the blind taste test type thing when you've got a customer that's coming in trying new stuff or you have a regular or you have someone that's been smoking cigars for 20, 30 years and they say something like, you know, that they don't like a certain brand or they've told you that and they say, well, give me something new and you know what their, their palate is. You know what they really enjoy. You're like, well, let me go back to the humidor. I'm going to take the band off and let me know what you think of that. And I, I got to tell you, nine times out of ten. It's usually something like say they did they did say something like, hey, I don't really care for Rocky Patel cigars. I've had a few and I'm just not a big fan of it. And uh, you come out with like say the LB1 that we're smoking right now. 
take the band off. You know, like, just smoke it. Tell me what you think of yeah. it and everything else. They start smoking it about a quarter of the way through, halfway through. You're like, hey, how you like that? And they're like, I really like this. What is it? It's Rock Patel LB1. And they're like, God yeah. damn it. <laughs> you know what's a great exercise? About 10 years ago, uh, when you could actually smoke in New York City, a uh, number of us would get together there for the big smoke or for other major events there. And we'd end up at the Davidoff shop uh, after dinner. And we'd go up there to the lounge. There'd be like six of us, ma all manufacturers. And Mike Herklotz would yep. go in the humidor and he would actually just pick out three or four different cigars. And we each had the three or four different cigars. None of them had the bands on. And yep. we'd literally, and you didn't know if it was any of yours or another competitor's and you'd smoke them. And it's amazing how a cigar, when you don't have the band and the pre preconceived notion of who the cigar maker is, what different appreciation you can have for the cigar that you're smoking. And it was a great, great learning exercise for me. Yeah. I think it was for all the other manufacturers there. It was awesome. And you ought to try that sometime. If you got three or four aficionado friends who enjoy cigars, Go out there, randomly pick two or three, buy three or four different cigars, take the bands off, have an evening where you're enjoying a couple cocktails, and then pass, you know, smoke two at a time. It's always good to compare when you got two lit at a time. And try them and compare them. to. You'll be pleasantly surprised what you end up liking and disliking. Well, yeah, and from, from the retail side, I think it's the same thing. If you're going into your brick and mortar, right? Do that. Ask ask the person, like the humidor manager or whoever it is, you know, that you're dealing with on a normal basis and you trust them. You've been going in there long enough. I would encourage people to go into a, a shop and say, hey, what's new or what's new to me? Take the band off because I want to actually smoke this blind so that I can get it of what this cigar actually is. And then yeah. tell me halfway through when I'm done with it, I'm going to tell you what I think of it. And I think you might actually find to that point, not only like from you guys, from a manufacturer side where you're trying each other's cigars, but you might broaden your horizons and figure out that you like things that you've never tried. Yeah. And I'm curious to see how many people that are watching actually retro the cigar, which means, you know, you can blow a little bit of the smoke out through your nose. And the reason I say that is typically when you just blow the smoke out through your mouth, your mouth has about 15 sensory perceptive receptacles and, and you get certain flavors, <laughs> but your nose has over 50. And that's why when you drink a wine, the glassware is so important because you're actually taking smelling it through your nose first. If you ever try this, if you close your nose and try a shot of tequila, vodka, scotch, it's hard to tell the difference. Hence, when we were young, when you had to take some medicine, your mom always closed your nose so you wouldn't actually get that bitter taste of the medicine in your mouth That's because right. a lot of it's in the smell. So if you take that cigar, roll the smoke out of your nose, but then roll some more smoke out of your nose, you're going to get much, many more layers of flavor, right. uh, combination of different flavors, and, and it'll be you'll, you'll feel like you're smoking two different cigars. You know, you bring that up and um... – you know, I grew up in a household that uh, when we went back to Chicago and, and if there was a flu and this is very, I'm not going to say this is a cure for anything, but uh, you know, I had a grandmother in, in Chicago that she uh, always had one bottle of whiskey in the house. So if there was uh, any sickness flu or otherwise, and you were visiting grandma's house. Yeah, it is. You know, I'm talking like yep. 10 years old. No, no, no. I agree with you. We had, we you had to take your shot. You yeah, take a shot. That you got if you had bad cold, you had to take a little shot of cognac, and you know, cognac oh. same way. So yeah, we had to do the the plug the nose thing because at ten years old, you know, you got this whiskey, and as soon as it hits your nose, you're about to throw up already. Yep. You're already not feeling well. But it was every night if you were at grandma's house, you were gonna have to take a shot of whiskey. And I started thinking that maybe it's because she just wanted to get rid of the whiskey because she's more of a gin drinker. She turned into a vodka drinker before she passed. But uh, you know, that was that was it. That was the medicinal. That that's a I think that's an age thing. You don't hear that as much anymore. No, you don't hear that much anymore. Be child abuse now with the new new laws out there. But you can get many medicine that you can find on the shelf no matter what, right? Because the FDA has got it all figured out, right? <laughs> um, you guys, as we're closing out part one, and we're going to get into part two here, um, Rocky, we, we do this now on the, the podcast, and I love doing this when I've got reps. I've got uh, guys like yourself on that uh, are, are the face and also the mind behind all this stuff. But we're going to go around the uh, the circle here and give a one out of 10 
on both the whiskey and the cigar. So 10 being the best, give me a, a rating. Rob, I'm going to start with you. I want to put you on the spot with your boss on the line here, Perfect. which is another thing that I love doing. Perfect. <laughs> so whiskey and cigar out of 10 individually. And then how do you think they, they've paired together tonight with the Rocky Patel LB1 and the Monkey Shoulder blended scotch whiskey? Well, starting with the uh, scotch whiskey here. Um, yeah, I'm actually going to uh, put this uh, at a good seven and a half. Half. Very specific. Uh, yeah, it's uh, it's delicious. I I, uh, I mean, going in blind, not having it before, I, I didn't know what to expect. And as I mentioned earlier, worrying if there was going to be that heat there. Um, but yeah, that the smoothness, the creaminess of this, uh, with the subtle sweetness, it's uh, it's nice. Uh, it, it might actually move up the scale a little bit as I you know keep emptying this bottle. But uh, yeah, this this might be a staple for me. Yeah, I'm, I'm enjoying it quite well. Like yeah. a lot of whiskeys, the more you drink, it uh, goes down smoother. Yeah, absolutely. As now, we all know. With the cigar, it's funny, you know, we're talking about the, uh, you know, preconceived notions of how I don't like this or how I don't like that. I remember when I first started smoking cigars, um, my favorite two were uh, uh, a Connecticut shade. You know, when I was newer into it, I, I, I loved the creaminess of a shade um, and uh, a Cameroon wrapper. That that was it. That's those were my my mainstays. That's that's what I smoked the most of. Um, and I had smoked a couple Habano cigars, and I didn't I didn't enjoy them. So for years I would not smoke a Habano wrapper because I was just already in my brain. I'm like, no, I'm not gonna like that. Yeah. And coinc coincidentally, today it's my number one. I mean, typically that my every day my go to blend is going to be a Habano rapper and uh, and I'm not saying this because Rocky's on here with us but this is um, I mean one of the most enjoyable cigars I've ever had yeah, personally I, I as I, me I mentioned all the time you know when I'm out and people are asking me what I think about it I always say I like to get a little nerdy with this one on how it starts out how the oiliness you know kicks in that nice sweet finish on it I, I love this blend. Um, you know, I, I always like to leave room for uh, something on the scale to uh, do better, but I, I have to put this one at a nine for me. So nice. this is this is one of my favorite blends. I'm one uh, uh, happy Rocky, you know, came out with this blend as a cigar lover, and two happy Rocky came out with this blend as a cigar rep that works for him <laughs> because uh, it, it, it's nice to always have this uh, readily available as a go-to. Absolutely. So right. the pairing, I, I do, I think it, it's fantastic. You know, they, they, they bounce off each other quite well. So the, the, the smoothness, the creaminess of the scotch and then the oiliness uh, of this wrapper, it's, it's, yeah, it's delicious. Fantastic. Rocky, how about yourself? So, with so the monkey I think shoulder. that this monkey shoulder pairs really, really well with this cigar only because I think that this scotch, it doesn't have that big peat. At the same time, it doesn't have a ton of sweetness. It's got a lot of balance to it. Uh, it it's smooth. Uh, I, would, I would say that the monkey shoulder compared to a lot of scotches, and I like a lot of Japanese whiskeys. I've been drinking a lot of those recently. I'd give that probably about a eight okay for, for the monkey shoulder yeah and then <clears throat> as far as the cigar is concerned you know i i smoke a lot of medium to full-bodied cigars i would say that this is medium plus i think it's got a lot of complexity a lot of character but yet very elegant and well balanced like rob said you really really feel the oil not only in the fingers but when you actually put the cigar to your mouth it's got that nice oiliness that creaminess that balance to it. Uh, I wouldn't say that it's got spice or pepper. That's not the cigar. Uh, I do like some hints of spice and pepper. Uh, it, it, I wouldn't say it's overwhelmingly sweet. I just think it's a great balanced cigar that burns perfectly, tastes great. I would probably give this cigar 8.75. Uh, I'm very particular about, you know, uh, getting to that nine plus level. Right. Uh, very few cigars that get there, so I'll give it 8.75 on the cigar and 8 on the monkey shoulder. That's good, and you said it paired well together, and I, I agree with you guys on this this pairing. I mean, it, it it does go well together. Obviously, I've never had this 
these two together, but uh, it is actually a back and forth. I mean, this is something you can sip on. You can have a conversation like we're having. You can smoke the cigar. Uh, monkey shoulder, I would give. I look at the price point sometimes with this stuff too. Again, 30 some dollars for a bottle of whiskey, for a fifth of whiskey yeah. anymore is, is fleeting. Like right. the prices on everything, the bourbon, I think really kind of the bourbon boom that we're in, we're still in, it's, it's, it's pushing price points up and scotches and Irish whiskeys have kind of, at least in the U S and in, in Ohio area, they've started kind of taking that as a, as a trigger point to say, all right, if they're charging this, we can charge more monkey shoulder at $33, 30 to 35, depending on where you're at. I mean, I'm, I'm in that eight, eight to nine range. I'd, I'd say an eight. And then if you're looking for a $30 bottle, and you, and you like to try scotches, if you're a scotch drinker, you're a bourbon drinker, for 30 some dollars, low 30s, this is pushing towards a nine for me because, again, bang for your buck on this bottle, I think, is, is absolutely a killer combo because bang for your buck, when you look at whiskeys, there's more and more. every. It's like cigars. Every time you go in the shop, I feel like, every time you go in a liquor store, there's new bottles and you, you haven't had them. So you're looking at it. And a lot of the bourbons that we review on here, you're walking in at a price point of 40 to $50 on most of them. So if you can find a bottle of whiskey for thirty some dollars, thirty three dollars, it, it's tough to beat, especially one that drinks like this. As far as the cigar, you know, again, not to just talk about price point, we haven't talked about it a whole lot, but I think the uh, the price point on this is is absolutely killer. You're looking at sub ten dollars. Is that correct? Absolutely. Yeah. So for that price point, it looks like Rocky may have frozen. Hopefully, we got him back here. We didn't lose him again, but. Uh, I look at the the LB1 as something that one thing that you guys, I agree with you guys as far as the complexity and everything else um, that you guys, I'm not going to necessarily reiterate all that stuff. But one thing I've noticed about this cigar is that it actually builds a bit. And that's what I like about the complexity of it is that yeah. as you're smoking it now, granted, I'm getting towards the end of the cigar right now. And I would say that it has built a little bit in strength on the palate. Yep. Um, there, there's, there's some bolder flavors. It's, it's not necessarily getting any, any heat or hot, you know, from, from how it's smoking, but it has built nicely. Right. Uh, and, and that's what I like about this cigar. So again, all things considered price, construction, everything else, you know, I'm in that, that eight to nine range as well. I mean, yeah. this is something that's smoking extremely well. Yeah. And again, if you can find a cigar that is coming in the average price, I feel like on the shelf, these, these more recent years is in that 10 plus you're at 11, $12 for a cigar coming in that's smoking like this. Right. And I don't know if it's the size of your guys' company that you're able to offer this as far as where you're getting the tobacco, you're growing tobacco and, and the, the age of it. But it, it's, it's interesting to me that this cigar smokes like it does for that, you know, nine to $10 range, depending on the size. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. It's, uh, you know, it's one of the things, I mean, it, it's company wide with, with the product that we release, we, we try to keep it at that price point. So it's accessible. Yeah. You know, when, when Rocky started doing this, you know, that was kind of his MO is, is, you know, making that premium quality cigar for the everyday guy. And uh, he really fights when he's picking his, you know, blends, his tobaccos, you know, everything through the process to maintain that, you know, so everybody can enjoy them. Absolutely. Absolutely. So. Rocky, I, I said, I don't know if you heard, uh, I, I gave uh, the, the LB1 an yeah. 8 to 9 on that that blend because of the, the way it smokes. And I said that it builds. You guys didn't say this, but I, I added to what you guys had said on the fact that it, it builds a bit. Like I'm getting towards the end of the cigar and it's it's built. Not necessarily in strength, but on your palate, there's, there's more to it. It's not one that gets drowned out by a whiskey. It's not one that as you're smoking it, it gets lighter because you've gotten used to it on your palate. It, it grows in flavor, and I like that about that cigar. So I'm wondering when the two of you are going to sing a little Bocelli with the voice. <laughs> I'm not that far into this bottle yet, so yeah. <laughs> maybe that's that's after hours. But yeah. uh, as we as we round out part one here, and if you're listening on Facebook Live or YouTube Live, I, I do want to say stay tuned for for part two. This is uh, where we get into. The, the topic of it, we'll still, we'll still talk about cigars, but it's uh, what the hell was I thinking? And I think uh, obviously Rocky's got a lot of those pivotal points in his uh, life and career that uh, would definitely be something you look back and what the hell was I thinking? I know Rob has, we alluded to that, getting into the cigar industry. I have my own stories if, uh, if there's any, any uh, part of the conversation that I can contribute to. But as we end out, I do want to thank our sponsors one more time for part one. 
you know, Tinderbox at Easton, that's kind of the, the hub of all this. And uh, again, the LB1 is the featured cigar for part one. And it's part of a Rocky Patel stay at home sampler. And that's going to be 30% off. Contact Easton Tinderbox at gmail.com. As we're going through all the COVID-19 stuff, we are still shipping out at Tinderbox at Easton. And we do want to make sure you guys, as you, everyone still has time on their hands a bit more typically than, than most. This is something that, you know, if you've got it, as we're getting into warmer weather all across the nation, we want to make sure that you guys can enjoy some good cigars. The LB1 also, as we are talking about, there was going to be the Smoking 10 event this year. Unfortunately, it got canceled. Rocky was going to be there. And so with Rocky being on this week, we want to offer from Tinderbox at Easton that we can do 20% off a box of LB1s and also 20% off a box of Special Edition, which is what I'm going to light up next so we can talk about briefly as well during this part two. Uh, also, Altidus USA, we, we appreciate everything you see behind me. Monte Cristo, H. Upman, move my head so you can see Monte Cristo. Romeo Julieta, a lot of other great brands, iconic brands that they they put out. I've got a, uh, a newer one, the Hispaniola, that we talked about a few weeks ago when we did the Altidus special. But uh, they've been a big supporter of this, and we appreciate all the things that they've done for this podcast. Also, be a cigar company. Check out the gold and silver. Those have been flying since we've had them back. We appreciate all the support on that and, and, and the be a cigar company. Uh, we love having more and more people enjoy that. There's another sponsor, and that's you guys that are listening with the Patreon page. On patreon.com slash bourbon and BS podcast, you guys can actually contribute. It helps us do things like this stream yard. It helps us do things like get guests like these guys and and really support the podcast and help this thing going as we we have to, you know, add to our technology as we get into different, you know, we're able to get guests like Rock Patel when he's not necessarily in Columbus area. This has been a huge help. So thank you to you guys. Check it out if you guys want to be a part of that. There's going to be as we get out of this T-shirts like the one I'm wearing, things like that, that you guys will get as gifts as you support us and and the community on Facebook. If you guys are looking for a good group of people, Bourbon and BS community page on Facebook, it just passed a thousand uh, in the last probably four months since it's been started, five months maybe, that this has reached a thousand members. And there's a lot of great community effort as far as people learning from each other, getting to know people. And a lot of that you see on the, uh, the feed when we're going live. So uh, guys, I appreciate it. And as we round out part one, I want to I want to raise a glass. Cheers, guys, to part one. Cheers. And guys, thank you very much. Stay tuned for part two. Too late for all that. All right, and we're gonna. Uh, do you guys need a break? You guys good? Good. I got a chance to make a cocktail. Yeah. Go ahead. You got a cocktail coming? Yeah, I just came in here so I could power up the computer. Yeah, I thought I thought about that when you took the computer outside. <laughs> I'm not yeah. used to, I haven't opened up this laptop in over two years. Is that right? <laughs> Is that my dream? Oh. Yeah, I haven't opened up this laptop in over two years. So it's like, I'm not too tech savvy at all. That's and fair. Well, a lot of times my phone kept interrupting our feed. And so every time it interrupted the feed, the volume went off. So Yeah, well, we appreciate you sticking with us on this. No problem. And we appreciate everyone listening right now. I do want to say um, I will put this up there. If you guys have any questions as we roll into part two when Rob comes back and Rocky's mixing a cocktail here, if you have any questions for Rocky or Rob, we'll try to get you on here as far as your questions that they can answer. Um, I did have, while we're in the interim here, Rocky, we had a question about COVID-19, how this has affected you know, your business, the, the premium cigar business from the, the the manufacturer side? Well, I mean, it's been difficult because all the factories are closed, both in Nicaragua and Honduras. So obviously we can't get any shipments. We can't get any boxes made. The box factories are closed. Even though I mentioned that we have cigars that are aging for 20, 22, 24 months, we certainly have an inventory of great blends that have been aging in the aging room. But when the box factories close, uh, there's no boxes to pack them in and certainly nobody ship them in. Now, Honduras just opened up yesterday and, uh, you know, we've been busy making sure the safety of, of, of the people is our number one priority. Uh, we've implemented, uh, you know, social distancing and hygiene and cleanliness in the factories and uh, a whole new set of rules that they're not used to in Honduras and Nicaragua. So I've been busy with that. Um, I think uh, a lot of the business uh, obviously has shifted since most of the stores are closed to the internet and to some of the liquor chains. And I urge everybody out there 
to support your local brick and mortar stores, especially when they open. They're the frontline stores that we depend on. They give you the education. You get a chance to get somebody knowledgeable about cigars to service you and point you in the right direction. You have lounges where you can smoke there. Uh, you have to remember these stores pay rent. Uh, they're in the service business and they certainly have a great plethora of cigars to try and enjoy. And so uh, support your local brick and mortar tinderbox Easton. Uh, shout out to you all, uh, you know, anybody watching, please support those stores. Uh, they're gonna go through a very, very difficult period here. Uh, you know, it's tough when you've got to make rent payments and you have no income coming in. We need our mom and pop retailers. They're very, very important to this business. We are a family business all the way from the growers to the manufacturers, to the retailers, to the consumers. So let's stay loyal and support our local brick and mortar stores, support Tinderbox Easton. It's very, very important to the livelihood and the future of this business. No, that's a great point. That's that definitely a good takeaway from that. I mean, that's that's how we're all getting through this is obviously together. I mean, that's the the positivity of, of things like we're doing tonight. So, uh, Rob, you good up there? I'm doing great, man. All Absolutely. right, good. All right, I'm gonna I'm gonna start part two for the uh, the audio here, just so you, you guys, uh, you know, Rob, you know how this goes, Rocky. I'm gonna rattle through the sponsors again. So, and go. Welcome back to the Bourbon and BS Podcast. This is episode 116, part two. We are continuing the conversation. If you guys have not checked out part one or if you're tuning in on the live right now, please go back and listen. We had a great part one learning about the uh, Rock Vitel LB1, which was brought to you by Tinderbox at Easton, one of our sponsors. It's part of a Rock Vitel special stay-at-home sampler during this time that we are shipping out at Tinderbox at Easton that you guys can get your hands on. Retail's a little over $70, and we're, we're putting out there 30% off and that's going to be $49.95 plus shipping and tax. And also the LB1, we are going to be selling 20% off on the boxes as well as what I just lit up, the special edition from Rocky Patel, 20% off boxes of that as well. So if you have any, any needs or wants as far as cigars, this is the week to do that with Rocky Patel Cigars. And it's going to be, uh, again, eastontinderbox at gmail.com. We also want to thank Altidus. We mentioned that in the first part as well. For the sponsorship and continued support as well as typically the weekly second cigar but since we've got rocky and rob on we're going to be lighting up another rocky patel cigar which like i said is the special edition so um we also have the bs cigar company the gold and silver are shipping out so if you are interested in that you can either email easton tinderbox at gmail.com or you can email bs cigar company at gmail.com and also the patreon page so we appreciate all the support patreon.com slash bourbon and bs podcast and you guys can support us as well. We're trying to get Rocky back here. We've had some technical difficulties tonight. If you guys are listening to the audio on part two, and for those of you sticking with us, we appreciate all that support. Uh, we're hoping to get Rocky back here. It looks like he just tuned back in. He said he hasn't used this laptop for about two years. So uh, I'm, I'm not surprised that we're having some issues with that. But um, the topic tonight is, is what the hell was I thinking? And when I was talking to Rob about this topic, uh, this is something that during this time, you know, everyone's talking COVID. They're talking about, you know, the, the, how everyone's getting through this. But it makes me look back at, at times where other points of your life where whether it's the national or global crisis that we're in, this is something that it, it's it's a time where you look back and, and there are pivotal points in life, whether it be in personal relationships, career wise, health issues. But you look back and. And hopefully, whether it was a good situation that you guys made a change or a bad situation, you know, things are going good. Things are going bad. And you make a, a shift in your life. And even at the time, you're like, what the hell am I thinking? And when you look back at it, hopefully there's lessons there that you can apply as you go forward in life. And it's it, it, that what the hell was I thinking back then? And why can't I do it now? So, and Rob, we talked about with you, you know, getting in the cigar industry and Rocky, you've got a great story that uh, I, I've, you know, I've heard over the years, but, you know, when you look up Rocky Patel uh, online or you, you read about you, it's it's always starts with, well, Rocky Patel, you know, it always starts with a was a, an attorney in Hollywood. That's that's just like the way I, there's a story before that, obviously. But when people are looking up Rocky Patel cigars, it's, you know, he was an attorney in the, the celebrity world. And, you know, you got actors and these these high profile clients. And I remember when I was I was meeting with you, um, probably for the first time, really in a personal level, 
back in October and and we were talking about it and you started telling a story about how you you made a shift in your life and you wanted to get into cigars. You, obviously, there was a passion there. And you were talking about going down to Honduras. I don't know if it was the first time or the, wh- whichever time it was. And I'm listening to the story where you're on this whatever. I, I think of it as, if I remember correctly, it was like a two or three day venture out to these fields. And you were you had people with you. And, and a couple of them had machetes with them and there's all sorts of stories and you're staying in these places. And I'm thinking to myself, if I was, you know, worked my whole life to become an attorney and you, 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 you got into these high profile that, that you're looking around, you, you know, it's high life. It's, it's everything, you know, money's everywhere. There's, there's big personalities, there's everything like that. And I started thinking to myself, and then the next thing you know, you make a career shift voluntarily to go into the cigar business. And now you're in a third world country and you're in probably not the most safe conditions, at least when you first started getting down there and getting your foot in the door, but you're, you're surrounded by this. And I, I asked you when we were hanging out, I was like, did you ever think to yourself, like, what the hell was I thinking? I should go back to Hollywood. I should go back to, to being an attorney and going back to more or less a desk job as opposed to being around machetes. Yeah, I was, it was crazy. I mean, uh, <laughs> I'll tell you this much. The first couple of times I went down there and I came back, I, I, I looked at my family, I looked at everyone, my friends, and I'm like, what the hell did I, what did I get involved in? You know, it was right. insane. This was, you got to remember back in 94, 95, this was when the Sandinistas and the Contras had just finished battling up. Central America was very unstable. Uh, it was, uh, Honduras was riddled with landmines. Um, you know, the first time I went down there, all you saw was U.S. Marines, and uh, there's only one little hotel called the Granada Hotel in Don Lee, uh, where the factory was at that time that was making their cigars, and there was no AC, there was no good plumbing, there was no hot water, there was nothing, and uh, you basically had a few Marines there. They were there to get rid of the landmines, and, and I remember the first time uh, this guy, Gabriel, picked me up at the airport and brought me to the hotel in Tegucigalpa before we went to Don Lee. And uh, I went up to my room and he said, just wave to me from the balcony. And I started waving and he pulled out his gun uh, through his uh, uh, SUV uh, and, and the rooftop. And he just fired like six shots. Boom, 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 boom. I said, this is insane. Uh, so... That same guy ended up taking me down to Honduras and he was making our cigars at the time for us. I really didn't know anybody. This is way before I met the Placencia family and all those other families that we work closely with now. So, uh, you know, in, in hindsight, I'll tell this story and then I'll finish off with something that's very, very interesting that's in the new Marcos, uh, Narcos show. If yeah. any of you have seen Narcos, uh, I'm going to tie this story in, but uh, he, he picks me up and he goes, I'm going to take you to this new farm we bought. And I go, listen, I got three, four hours. I got to be back. I got a lot of work to do. I got tons of stuff. I got to get back to, to the U.S. In, in a couple of days. And I'm, I'm just here for, you know, two days. Uh, if it's a couple hour ride, we can do it. He goes, don't worry, don't worry. I'll get you back. The next thing you know, uh, it's about dusk and we start driving up this mountaintop and three and a half hours up this ride on the mountain, uh, it just starts pouring rain and we kept getting stuck every 20, 30 minutes. And I'm, it's two of us, I'm behind the car, pushing the car, you know, trying to stick a log or something in it. So, and this happens every 30 minutes. This happens for two and a half hours, riddled in mud, covered in mud. Finally at midnight, we get to this farmhouse. There's nothing but pigs and chickens running around. There's not a piece of furniture there laying on the floor, hungry as hell. And I'm like, okay, let's go back. You can't, we can't go back tonight. Next morning, he goes <laughs> on the other side of the mountain. I thought we were going back. He goes, no, 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 you got to see this farm. I said, you're out of your mind. This guy was insane. Yeah. And I'll tell you why he's insane later. So uh, no, you're, you're, you're alluding to it already. We but... On the other side of the mountain, we end up on this river that d- divides Nicaragua and Honduras. And we're on the river. I'm trying to think of the name, but it'll come to me. And we're on this river. And next thing, we're getting on these little boats. And they look like the boats that basically you have in Thailand that you see people going to, you know, where you have these river floating boats, benches across, literally apart every foot and a half. And there's like 12 people that can fit on these benches. And I'm sitting four inches away from another face on this bench. There are pigs on the boat. There's chickens on the boat. <laughs> we start taking this boat down, and every quarter mile, the boat keeps 
getting hung up because it's so shallow. We're getting out of the boat, we're pushing the boat. It's like insanity right now. It's lightning, it's raining on us, hungry. Finally, the next day goes by. Now I'm supposed to be back in three hours. The next day goes by, it's getting night. And three all hours ago, two days ago. Floating down the river, we see all these armed Sandinistas with Sandinista flags. They all got machine guns. They all got machetes and it's getting quite dangerous. Bunch of guys floating down the river. We pull up to this house. Wait, 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 wait. You guys floating down the river, just bodies floating down the no, river? No, we're floating on this boat. Okay. We're <laughs> on this boat down the river, okay? And we're, as we're floating down this river, now it's nightfall and we're starving. We pull up to this house and we see this house that we pull up to and everybody on the boat gets out to this house. We pay $20 for this lady to serve us food. Well, the the husband in the house, there's a pig there. She slaughter, He slaughters a pig right in front of us, literally at, 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 at my feet, okay? I lost my appetite right there. She had a flashlight she was holding between her neck and her shoulder. There's no electricity anywhere, pitch black. She's got a flashlight. They slaughter this pig. They start cooking this pig and everybody's eating. I lost my appetite right then. Then we decide to go to bed. We go to bed. There's about 12 hammocks there. So everybody in boat is on this little tiny patio. Literally the hammocks are touching each other. 2.33 in the morning, all of a sudden I hear gunshots. Bam, 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 bam. I hear this ruckus. I turn on my flashlight. All I could see is machetes and blood. Next thing you know, it's starting to, we're like, what the hell is going on? We turn on all the flashlights. And what happened is two of the guys started fighting. One of the guys took a machete across this 19 year old kid's face, right across his mouth, between the two lips. His lower lip was hanging down like this. Holy shit. Totally perpendicular, whole lower lip hanging out, blood gushing out. I'm sitting there with a towel, holding his lip up, waiting for dusk. As soon as the light comes, you just see this kid about to pass out bleeding to death, lip hanging out. We throw him back on the boat. Now we're going again in the wrong direction to find the <laughs> hospital. Finally, an hour and a half later, we get to the hospital. I'm sitting on the bench across from him. The blood is going down my forearm, down my elbows, onto my knees, and I'm holding this thing that is loaded with blood. We drop this kid off at the hospital. I'm looking at Gabriel. I go, what the fuck is wrong with you? This is Three hour adventure, it's like a bad movie. He goes, We're still not at the like a good so movie, you're honestly. Out of your mind. You're out of your mind. So we float another six hours and then we finally get to this farm. We get to this farm, it's in the middle of nowhere, it's got a waterfall. And I remember smoking a cigar, literally sitting under the waterfall, saying, Finally, I'm at heaven, peace of mind. And then thinking at the same time that I got an hour and a half to go back on the same journey. And it was the most ridiculous thing in the world. We had the FBI looking for me. We had all the police looking for me. We had everybody in the world looking for me. They had no idea where the hell I was. It was insane. Not well, a whole lot of cell guy, service down there. So, yeah, this same guy, he's nuts. He's crazy. So a couple years later, I find out he comes to LA. This is when I'm still living in LA. And he shows up and I find out and I do some research. He goes, well, I need you to help my father-in-law get out of prison. And I said, what happened to your father-in-law? Well, his father-in-law was a famous guy by the name of Mata. He was one of the biggest drug lords in the world. If you look at the movie Narcos, the Mexican episode, he was the guy who was loading up all the planes full of cocaine. They were sending the, you know, Reagan and uh, Ali North, and they were sending all these planes full of arms down to Honduras so that they could supply the contrast to fight the Sandinistas. And they would fill up those planes back with cocaine and send them back. Well, the American military came in in the middle of the night and captured him from his home and took him back. And he had 100 life sentences. You can Google it, you can look it up. He's in the most secure federal prison in Colorado. You can't see daylight. This He was the same person responsible for killing two DE agents in Mexico, oh also and part of that group. Interpol was looking for him, FBI was looking for him. The reason they caught him is because he was actually sending so much money into these banks in Texas and they would literally take a plane, 
fly it into Texas or wherever, burn it up and get a new plane. So this is a true story. This is what happened. And this guy was a son-in-law. And I said, well, let me see some transcripts because I had no idea what he was talking about. They literally brought a room full of transcripts that would fill up your kitchen. And it was like, I started reading these things. I go, there's no shot in hell this guy's going to come back. <laughs> so, yeah, it was an insane story. I remember when we used to go, have to go to Jalapa or have to go to the farms to pay the workers. We'd literally be in a car, two people with machine guns on both sides because we had cash on us to pay these people at that time, literally standing guard while we're driving through. So it was a very dangerous time there. It was a dangerous area. It was crazy. And I... I, I, I have that on video somewhere. I got to dig it out. But it was the most nutty journey I've ever experienced. And I was thinking to myself, how did I get from Beverly Hills practicing law to being in the middle of a shit show in a third world country? And everyone always told me back then, you're not in hell, but you can see hell from here. <laughs> so, yeah, two, two questions. Um, during that trip, and, and f mind you, for everyone out there... Uh, that's not your typical story. If you're going to get into the cigar industry, just so you know, it's, it's uh, there's different levels that you can jump in. Now, Rocky obviously has jumped in at this point back in the nineties. Uh, he, he jumped into the deep end with, uh, with, with, with a lot of waves. But uh, um, did you think during this trip that you just wish you were, you didn't do this, that you wish that you're like, why I would love to be in my office right now in air conditioning, you know, what, you know what I wish for was just making it back alive. There you yeah. go. That's what I was wishing. I said, I hope I make it back alive from this crazy adventure because nobody knows where I am, what I'm doing. They'll never find me. And that's what I was wishing the whole time I was there. A uh, follow-up question. Who who do you want to play you in this uh, this Netflix movie about Rocky Patel <laughs> in the next five years? Who's the uh, actor that you uh, want to is there an actor out there? I mean, we're talking like, you know, Brad Pitt. Are we talking like, who, who are we talking about? No, 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 no. Um, I can't even think of it. But the guy that would be amazing at this would be, uh, uh, what's his name? He's uh, the, the Latin actor. He's really good. He's, he's got the dark circle under his eyes. He's, uh, he's in a lot of the, the cocaine movies. Uh, what is, oh, God, what's his young name? Um, I'm thinking, uh, I don't know, what Javier Bardem. I met him. I, 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 I Scotches with him at this dive bar in Santa Monica, California. Of course. Uh, um, what's his name? Um, he, he's in a lot of movies. He was in a couple of the big drug trafficking movies. As uh, Nate saying, Rami Malek. No, it's not Rami Malek. Uh, I don't think this is who you're talking about. Ryan Newman says Jake Gyllenhaal should play you. Which no, I don't, no, I don't no, see. no. He's a uh, God. Uh, I can see his face, and I can't think of his name right now. It, it'll come to you, but uh, Rob, you got something to say here. No, I'm like. as Rocky. So obviously, thankfully, you do get back alive. And what was it that made you say, "I still want to do it"? What about the cigar industry? You know, it, it gave you that passion to want to keep going in this. Well, I'm stubborn. Well, uh, let me tell you what really made me do this is everyone said you'll never make it you're not of cuban descent you're not of latin descent this is a business that's typically handed down from generation to generation uh you just don't get in the cigar business and initially i started as an investor um you know i was hanging out in the grand havana room in la and a young guy by the name of phil zangi who now has the Indian motorcycle cigar. He was he was my partner. He was the one who asked me to invest in making cigars. And that's how I started out. And then ultimately, when I bought him out and I was stuck with the company, uh, everyone basically laughed at me and said, forget it. You'll never get your money back. You'll never make it. This is a business that's handed down from generation to generation. You just don't get in the cigar business. And so I, I you know, I, it was a fear of failure. It was a fear of failure that kept me going. I said I decided to do something, and I'm certainly not going to fail at it. And that's what drove me. Beautiful. Did you did you continue to practice law in the, the transition? I did. So I practiced till '99, and then in uh, uh, and in 2000 is when we moved to Naples, Florida, and I was having other people making cigars for me and. And every time, you know, I had people, I had Augusto Reyes making cigars in Dominican, I had Nestor making cigars in Honduras. And, and back then, 
uh, there was a shortage of good tobaccos. There was a boom had just ended, but people were just making cigars to make cigars. And I'd come up with some good blends. We had the Super Forte and we had our classic line that would have great brands, blends. When I went to the store, uh, you know, we'd be able to uh, sell cigars. As soon as I left, the cigars stopped selling because they were so inconsistent. The, the wrapper wasn't fermented enough. They changed the binder. Uh, the blends would change. And there were times I wanted to cry uh, you know, I didn't have a lot of money when you bought $100,000 of the cigars and you got the shipment and you weren't happy with it. What else could you do? Right. right. So it was in 2001 when we decided to take control of our own manufacturing. And that's when I partnered up with the Placencia family. And I said, listen, you guys are known as some of the great, greatest growers of Cuban seed tobacco in the world, but nobody looks at you as a great cigar manufacturer. They look at the Fuentes, they look at the Padrones, they look at some of these great families, Ernesto Perez Carrillo, all these families, but they don't let me, I don't have a ton of money. Give me your tobaccos, the range of tobaccos you have. Allow me to spend time curing the tobacco, fermenting the tobacco, aging it. Let me, let me actually, you know, put in the strictest quality control standards possible that I'd learned from visiting all these factories, doing things right. And I promise you, I'll pay you back. Just allow me that. And that's when we came out with the edge. And then at the same time, there was a company called UST, US Tobacco that made Skoll in Copenhagen chewing tobacco. They did. They had decided to get in the cigar business. They spent $150 million buying all this great tobacco, but they didn't know what they were doing. And they decided to get out of the cigar business. And they had brands at that time Don Tomas and Astral and stuff yeah. like that, but they were struggling because they started giving them to the liquor distributors and the retailers blackballed them. So they had that 10 year old Sumatra wrapper from Ecuador and they had a 12 year old wrapper, broadleaf wrapper grown in the Talanga Valley in Honduras. And I said, let me buy all this wrapper. And they said, kid, we'll only allow you to take this wrapper if you make the cigars in this factory that we have because we want to keep people employed. So I literally built my own factory in their factory. They gave me carte blanche in curing and sorting and fermentation and construction. We limited the rollers to making 200 cigars per pair instead of 400 cigars per pair. And that's when we launched the vintage line, the 1990 and the 92 vintage. I made 152 blends, and I still remember the blend to heart by date. And it was the first blend out of the 152 that I picked. And it had one leaf of Dominican Allure, one leaf of Dominican Peloto, one leaf of Brazilian Matafina, one leaf of Esteli Lejero, one leaf of uh, Jalapa Lejero with the Mexican binder and those wrappers. And that cigar, when, we, when I had complete control of the production and I knew exactly what I was going to do, that's when I decided to put my name on my cigar. And I remember my brother and my cousin going, you're crazy. Who the hell cares about Rocky Patel? Who's going to buy a Rocky Patel cigar? Because the brand was called Indian Tobacco based on right. the Indian motorcycle company back then. So when we had complete control of the production and everything else and the strict quality control standards, 2001 is when we launched the brands with my name on it. And then we never looked back. So while you're telling the story which there's a lot of takeaways my first one is is that you're stubborn which can be translated obviously you say you're stubborn you're going to do it there's a lot of perseverance there obviously you know and, and in that time you went from that that uh, three-day cruise as i'm going to call it um with with all those stories to a point where you you learned a lot about the industry obviously you knew a lot but you're, you're getting into it more and more but uh there was also i think we figured out the actor through the, uh, the help of the viewers is, um, let me throw it up on the screen. But, but, oh, it's, uh, his last name starts with B. Uh, ben, is it Benicio Del Toro or no? Benicio Del Toro, yeah. yeah. Benicio oh, Del someone Toro. else said Antonio Banderas, and no, I feel no, like no. that'll be a well, different movie. Too, but Benicio Del Toro. There you go. All right, so through the community, we had a little bit of help there. But, uh, Benicio Del Toro, and it's funny because I met him through another friend uh, in Santa Monica, and we hung out, and he was a cool guy. Yeah. So, uh, cool Rob. King guy bar. So, you know, Rocky, we'll get back to, to some of the transitions, obviously, that you've done since then. But, Rob, talk to people about, because I think this is something that, obviously, we have Rock Patel on here. But, you know, from the other side of it, Rob, you were you were doing what before you got into the cigar industry? You said you're in here for six years now. You, you, you hooked up to, 
obviously a great company at that point, one of the, the industry leaders with Rocky Patel Cigars. But you were coming from what industry that got you into now you're, you're traveling the, the country repping cigars? Well, I was uh, 13 years in the automation industry, uh, selling industrial machining components. And uh, I got into that because uh, I started out doing some uh, carpentry after uh, college. And, uh, you know, I, I had to get out of that and do something a little bit more. And somebody uh, had just opened up a company, said, we need somebody on the phones. And uh, Rob, you're a talker. Which no. Yeah, I am. And uh, so they put me on the phones and uh, that just started off my, my sales career. So I did 13 years in that industry, you know, enjoyed it greatly. Uh, a lot of great relationships and friendships and uh, the, the internet kind of really put a kill to that industry um, because it was all engineering. So, you know, all the calculations and, you know, configuring of these uh, machines could be done online. So there was less of uh, that face to face. So I got quite bored with it, and uh, one of my good buddies uh, by the name of Sean Bustler, Sean Bustler worked at a uh, cigar lounge in uh, Dayton, Ohio, where I uh, am from, and uh, Sean had met Rocky at an event, and uh, they hit it off, and uh, Sean had moved down to Naples to work with Rocky, and, you know, through the years of going to visit my good buddy, and, uh, you know, that Florida and hang out at the beach. I got to know Rocky and uh, and, and Nish and, and Nimish and uh, the gang and uh, yeah, you know, I just enjoyed the company and uh, you know it was really nice to get to know the people. And then uh, it, it came up where they needed somebody in Chicago, and I happened to be down in, in Florida and uh, walked by uh, Dave Bullock, our VP of Sales, walked by his office and and we had a conversation. He said he needed somebody, and uh, it was it was that that point in my life, you know, I was 37 years old, I was not married, no kids, and uh, bored with the, the work I was doing, and it was the caution to the wind moment, you know, it's like, if I'm, if I'm going to make a change, it's going to be now, and honestly speaking, if it wasn't for Rocky Patel, I, I, I wouldn't have done it, I, if it was for a lesser brand, I, I, I wouldn't have done it, you know, I, I, I was, uh, I, I didn't want to, again, throw that caution to the wind, and it, you know, be a major uphill battle. Um, I believed in the product that Rocky had and also, you know, respect Rocky and his drive and what he's done, had done in the industry, you know, and obviously getting to know him on a personal level as well helped, you know, me feel confident in that uh, decision. And yeah, I, I just, just made that leap and, I mean, obviously, you know, the guy, everybody watching, you know, Steve himself and Rocky also. I mean, this is, this is everything that I could have asked for, you know. It, it, it's the, the brotherhood, the, 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 you know, the camaraderie that we have in this industry, the, the wonderful product that, you know, I am blessed to be able to sell, sell on a daily. It, it's amazing. So, it, it's, uh, yeah, when I did it, it was, I, okay, I did this film. I had an offer from a company out in Seattle, and it was an open offer. It was a name your, you know, I could name my price, and they would have, you know, grabbed me in a minute. I, I did, I, you know, I had some great relationships, and it was very tough to turn down that open offer. Um, but I did. I believed in Rocky. I believed in the company. You know, I, I, I had known Nimish quite well. I had hung out with Nimish a few times at, at uh, Burn Naples, and, uh, yeah, I just I felt confident in the guys that I was going to team up with. So I said, you know, now here, I, here I thought you were building cruise missiles and we could use you for defense in Honduras. And Nicaragua. <laughs> I've got that under, you know, under wraps a little bit. But, uh, you know, if we need to do something, we can talk about it, Rocky. Not well, on the air. Not the on reason the air. we hired you is somebody sent me a video of you singing at a lounge oh. and you we were doing Bocelli. And no. so but, you know, this guy's got the, there was no the, he, he can entertain us all day long, and that's the real reason you're hired. Now, is that part of the national, like the sales meeting every year? Is that that Rob's? Yeah, he does. Yeah, so he does sing at the sales meeting, there and you know. he sings every year at a trade show. 
at our yeah. booth in Las Vegas. Yeah, and then and Rocky gets me up. And there. he's a great yeah. rapper too. Uh, what's that song you sing, Rob? The famous the rap, song. Rapper of the light is the one everybody knows. Yeah, yeah. it's a crowd pleaser, man. That gets people going. Stop. Come on, do do a quick twenty second gig for us. <laughs> 20 seconds of a hip hop, a hippie to the hippie to hip hip hop. You don't stop a rocket to the bang bang boogie. Sit up, jump the boogie to the rhythm of the boogie to be. That's, uh, <laughs> that's impressive. That's impressive. A little musical interlude for everyone. There you uh, go. <laughs> a man of many, many talents. Uh, <laughs> it's interesting hearing both of your guys' story get in the cigar industry because I feel like a lot of people. Again, especially now, but all the time, you know, they, they get in these ruts, right? They And, and I, I kind of go back to you, Rocky, when you've got a successful career going, at least, you know, from from what you say and what I, I read and you're, you're doing well, you know, what is it sometimes that that pushes you? I mean, you know, Rob, Rob hit it on the head. I know saying there's a drive there and you said it's stubbornness. I think it's a combination of both. But I find a lot of people are, are they you hear them talking about when things are bad, they're looking for something else to do. But I feel like you might have a, and I'm not going to put words in your mouth, but I feel like you might have a, a bit of that drive where you've done well at one thing. There's a new passion. There's a new interest that you go head first into. What is the, the mentality? What was the, what was the purpose of, of switching from one successful career that you spent your life to, uh, devoting to, and then going into this type of industry? And now 25 years later, you've had success in this. I mean, what, what's the mentality there? Why, why the hell would you do that? Well, I mean, the reason I actually went after this as hard as I did is I wanted to prove everybody wrong that I couldn't make it. You know, that was number one. So everybody that told me I would never make it, I'd never make it. And you got to remember, in the 90s, there was a massive boom of people entering the cigar industry. Right. And I would say 99% of them failed. And everyone said, you're going to be another failure. And so that's what got me motivated to drive hard but what pushes me harder now is the fear of failure you know it, it's easy to get in the, work hard and be successful but when you're successful the drop to get down to failure is even bigger yeah. and so i never let the foot off the gas because it's a fear of failure and you're, and you're you're obviously employing a lot of people all over all over the world now at this point yeah, I mean, we've got uh, directly or indirectly anywhere between 2,500 to 3,000 employees. It's a lot of people. It's a lot of people. Yeah. And then obviously you didn't rest. I think, you know, that's that's something that a lot of people do, myself included, when I was when I was in the, the previous career. I, You know, it's like I didn't know what else to do with my life. You know, I was getting a good paycheck. And so I kind of rolled with that that career, even though at times I wasn't always the, the happiest. I wasn't challenged and all that stuff. And I, you know, more along the lines of, of, of Rob, where – you know, it was kind of handed to me. It was just one of those things after a decade of doing something else, you know, it was just like, hey, we're going to take the company in a different direction, even though things were going well. And now all of a sudden I had to figure it out. You, on the other hand, you're doing something successfully and you get into this industry and you're not even resting on your loyals, laurels now, which I find interesting because some of the listeners that aren't as familiar with Rocky Patel, they're more either bourbon drinkers, they're part of the community. Um, they just like to listen to the podcast for the second part. But you know, something that you've done in the more recent years is you've expanded your footprint, your your footprint of your name with the Burn Lounges. And and I had the opportunity to, to visit one of them for the first time, which, which is the newest one in Indianapolis. And for those that have been following this podcast for a long time, Jake Sanders is a humidor manager. He used to be a co-host on this show. And you had this successful cigar brand going, right? Ups and downs. And then down in your hometown, I mean, was this just a move so you had a place to smoke? You had the Naples well, Turn Lounge. You know, what it was is, you know, traveling around the world, being in some great cities. You know, after we got done with a very, very nice dinner, we wanted to go somewhere where we can have a nice cocktail, relax, and smoke a cigar. And every time we found a beautiful lounge, and, you know, at my age, I don't want to go to a nightclub with bottle service and boom, 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 and be right. pushed around and slammed. So we want to go somewhere sexy something that's very attractive, somewhere you can relax and enjoy. And there was nowhere for somebody that enjoys a cigar to go to. So I said, what if we build the nicest place in whatever city we're at? So it's the sexiest place. It's got a lot of appeal. It's got great music. It's got great scotches, bourbons, wines. And you have the opportunity to smoke a cigar. 
and you spend a lot of money on the HVAC system. So people that come in, women that come in, they don't leave with their hair smelling like smoke. So it's a sexy environment that attracts attractive women, that attracts professional people, or anybody. But you can listen to some great music. If you want to dance, you can dance. If you want to sit back and relax, you can. And you have the opportunity to smoke a cigar. So I wanted to build the sexiest lounge in that city that everybody would want to come to. And you have the opportunity to smoke a cigar. So we didn't build it as a cigar lounge. We built it because most people think of cigar lounges. They go in, they're smoky, they're dark, they're dungy, but right. all guys smoking cigars, drinking scotch. We wanted to build the hippest, coolest spot, yet you can smoke a cigar. And that was the whole concept behind the burn lounges. And, and, and what did you know at that point about starting a, 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 a cigar bar? Nothing. I mean, listen, when I built Burn in Naples, I built it so I would have a great place to go hang out. But I love design. I love architecture. I wanted to build something very, very sexy with a very cool vibe. We probably spent way more money than we need to spend on building some of these lounges in hindsight. But, you know, there, if you go to Indianapolis, Atlanta, Pittsburgh, Oklahoma City, Naples, where all these lounges are right now, uh, they're each individually elegant, sexy, unique, different and they bring a lot of culture into each of these cities. And so we've built a vibe that is very, very cool, very nurturing, very sexy, where you can smoke a cigar. And that was a goal. What, what's uh, what, what's keeping you from from getting to this point where you're like, all right, enough lounges, enough cigar blends. All right, we're, we're good. I mean, you know, I'm at this point where things are going well. People are, you know, my employees are taken care of. And last time I talked to you, actually, I, it might have been in uh, Indianapolis. It was, oh, we're doing this and this. We're looking at these cities. I mean, th it's like it's not stopping at this point. Well, there's, I mean, I, I'm looking at Nashville. I'm looking at Houston. I'm looking at Dallas, uh, possibly Vegas. And then we'll probably take a little break. But, you know, listen, this whole COVID virus has given me a whole different philosophy on life. I'm actually enjoying my life right now, believe it or not, as opposed to unpacking, packing, ironing, living on the road, uh, doing all that. This is a nice break to be able to work out, uh, have some solitude, uh, be able to cook, uh, just enjoy nature. Uh, it's amazing. I get on my bicycle and I ride. Can you can you just imagine what's going on in the world right now? The fact that there's no pollution for for two months and the, right. the world it's like the earth is getting a break. And you know, I, I was talking to a friend. They've never seen dolphins. And off the coast in Mumbai, India, which is Bombay, which is a big city, they're actually seeing dolphins there. There, it, it's 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 amazing what there's clean air in Delhi and Bombay and and places in China and all these places that are so polluted. So uh, I think we need to kind of just uh, look at everything and rethink uh, the experience. I think there's a lot of good things that are going to come out of this bad experience that everyone's. Uh, uh facing right now and uh i think it's going to rekindle uh it has for me what what is more important in life don't get me wrong i mean i'm not letting the foot off the gas but uh i'm certainly going to make uh more personal time to enjoy life do you think there's more of a balance coming out of this absolutely i think there's got to be a balance coming out of this you know i i just driving here from work today the amount of people i saw riding bicycles walking around uh, people that I've never seen exercising, enjoying nature, enjoying the world, enjoying stuff. Uh, there's got to be a lot more balance coming out of this. Yeah, I, I agree. I mean, I've seen a lot of that. I mean, even in my neighborhood and then when I've been driving around as well into other neighborhoods, you know, you, you see a lot more people out walking. You, you see them talking. Now, granted, from, you know, six feet or whatever away, but there's like neighbors. Like I, I talked on a previous podcast. I, I feel like it was actually last week with Watershed Distillery. I mean, you look out, there's there's neighbors that I've seen that I've lived in this house and this neighborhood I've lived here for seven years. This house I've lived here for a year. I'm seeing people that I've never seen before. And it's because they're out and about and they're not just going to the daily grind and they're not just, you know, going home and, you know, sitting in front of the TV and just try, trying to go back to work the next day. I feel like there's a lot of people out there that they're they're taking a lot more in. There is a lot of self-reflection out there. Absolutely. You know, How could you not? Yeah.
Absolutely. Yeah. I, I hope that, uh, you know, what comes out of it is, you know, I mean, we even see it in cigar lounge when you go to a cigar lounge and uh, a group of us are all just sit around doing our, our daily business, you know, buried in our cell phones or this and that uh, uh, so much today that maybe the seclusion will make us appreciate our neighbors a little bit more and want to be engaging and maybe look people in the eye a little bit more and have that conversation and that openness with one another. So, yeah. What are you guys finding right now? I mean, like, so that's one of the things I keep going back to this because I, I feel like this point is is so strong. Let's 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 kind of let's tie it into what's going on right now. When when I, I've I've talked on the podcast before, where when you're 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 in a rut, whether it's a good rut or bad rut, I feel like a lot of times everyone looks elsewhere for motivation. They look at people that are successful. They look at uh, people that have failed. They look at all these things. Like for you, Rocky, that's you, you're talking about. You know, failure is one of those things that that drives you as far as the the threat of failure. Um, one of the things that I've, I've always tried to tie in here is that a lot of the times when you look back, when you're, you're, you're struggling of getting out, like everything's going well and it's just kind of, it's mundane, it's a rut. Everything's going bad, it's a rut. You're, you're struggling, you don't want to get out of bed. But when you look back, sometimes it's a self-reflection. When were you your best self? When was everything clicking? And have you, either of you guys, been able to apply that as you get into a new career as you you know rocky you go from being an attorney to the cigar world now you're a more or less a a a bar owner as well you know rob you're going from sales now you're getting to outside sales you go from inside to outside you go from one industry now you're in cigars i mean when you're doing that I'm, i'm always i'm always absolutely blown away by people that they they look at themselves as their greatest role model at times because there are points in life that you do everything seems to be clicking so well that sometimes you have to like actually look within for motivation as opposed to just trying to keep up with the Joneses getting on Instagram these days and saying, Oh, I want to be more like this person. I want to be more like this person. But there's always a time in life. I think that things were going well enough and everything was so easy and you were your happiest that it drives you at that moment to say, okay, I need to get back to that. I need to recenter talking about today, like you were saying, Rocky, is that, you know, this is a, re- a rebalance, this is a self-reflection. I mean, have you guys experienced that at different points of your career or life? Well, as Rocky was saying, even even like right now, you know, one of my, when I was in my previous industry and I had my, you know, my eight to five office job, uh, you know, like Rocky, I, I, I love to cook as well. And, you know, I, I'd get out of work, i you know, stop by the local market, I, I, I'd make a one dinner i turn on some you know some nice music you know pour me a glass and 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 there was such a um you know just personal type of you know melodic you know sense of all this it was it was wonderful and that's one of the things that hearing all this especially that i've been able to get back to you know cooking dinners and and doing stuff that you know when we are on the road that we don't get to do as often you know when you're only home for two maybe three days a, a, a week if that um you, you don't have those simple enjoyments that you you know take for granted on a regular and uh and it's stuff like that where you know when i was just sitting there i was, I was making chili and you know just just cutting up you know the onions and the peppers and everything and again having the music playing and i'm and, and, and that that inner peace that kind of sits with me when i was doing it you know, remembering back to those days that I used to do it on a more of a regular basis. I'm like, you know what? That's something. Even when I we are back on the road full time and, and when I am home, I'm going to keep doing that because there is that that inner peace that that's derived from those you know situations that, as Rocky was saying and, and yourself, people be, being outside, getting on my bike more often and getting out there and, and, and enjoying, you know, the s- simplicity of things more often I, that for me that's what i need because it, it is a grind i mean rocky obviously knows it very well steve you know it because you, you talk to us reps on a daily you know there is that grind of hotel after hotel after hotel and uh you know you get home and more often it's like you get home and you're just you're done you know and, and, and you're sitting there and then you then and, you know you're home a day and then the next day you're planning for that next you know five days on the road. Well, my goal is, especially once we get back moving again, is to that day that I'm home is not just to sit there. You know, right. to, I'm taking advantage of that time at home more often. That time when I can, you know, 
go over a buddy's house and have a cigar and, and, and watch a movie in the garage, you know, to, to swing by my folks' house and, and, and spend time with them while I have it, you know, to, to get on the boat with the old man and do some fishing, that kind of thing. So I, it, 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 there's always that kind of self-reflection. And, and I think it is, it's up to everybody to look internally for that because that's what's going to keep you moving towards that, that better goal, you know, that, that inner happiness. I mean, I've always looked at the glass half full. Mm -hmm. uh, listen, uh, the grass is always greener on the other side of the fence. Uh, regardless of where you are in life, um, you know, people always think that you might be very successful and you're doing well and, you know, life is easy. And yeah, granted, it seems that way, but it's never. Everybody has their trials and tribulations. I mean, uh, you know, when you have over 2,500 employees. I mean, you're getting calls from people saying, hey, my son needs a pacemaker. Uh, you know, my son needs a hearing aid. Uh, he needs an eye operation. So you're dealing with those kinds of things. On top of which, uh, every time you start new ventures, you're, you're, you're identifying different things that you need to deal with, whether it, having a bar, uh, there might be, I've gone through six general managers in Naples before I found a good one. Uh, yeah. You might find bartenders stealing from you. You might they're, 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 so that nothing comes easy in life. There's if it was, then it would all be happy all the time. So the reality is, uh, every challenge that you want to overcome always has hurdles that you have to deal with, and you have to have a mindset that is very clear and clean. And you have to be able to go to bed knowing that, hey, this is not bad. I don't sit there and dwell on my issues and problems. I try to overcome them. I identify what those challenges are and I take them on one at a time and try to overcome them so that I can have peace in my heart. So it's never easy. It's never satisfying. And, and there's always more goals and more accomplishments. But I think with this virus, this is given us all an opportunity to sit back and really look at what is important in life. What is it that we're gonna, we're not gonna be here forever. And in the short time that we are here, what is it that's important in your life? What do you identify that matters? What gives you pleasure? And it doesn't necessarily have to be success and wealth and everything else. Each person is wired differently. And for each of us, we have to look at that and conquer those challenges and move forward. What is that for you, Rocky? Well, for me now, I think, you know, I'm, I'm going to be 60 years old. Uh, I'd like to get in my point in my life where I can spend more time with my parents, my family, uh, enjoy life a little bit, take care of my health. Uh, certainly, uh, you know, be involved in the business, but not to the degree where it's the only focus in life. And that's all I do is live out of a suitcase. So, you know, I, I want to get to a point where I have some balance. Yeah. And that's, that's probably, I would say, knowing what I know about you, that's, that's probably going to be your biggest next challenge where you're yeah. going to have to figure out how that works. How <laughs> that's a, that's always the big thing is someone that's well, that, would, that, would, that would be easy if people like Rob would work harder. Well, I'll talk to him about that. I, I'll, I'll make sure that's a talking point every time he walks into the shop. I'll do that for you the best I can, and, and we'll make sure that the the, the community here will uh, will message him yeah, and give out his personal. All of you order. buy more RP cigars. That would make it easier. For you. <laughs> On a side note, the fifty five was a great cigar. Are we going to see a sixty, or are we just going to stick with uh, twenty five? No, well, no, I don't know. I, I think there will be a sixty. Yes, oh, I agree. you know, it's funny prior. Prior to all this FDA regulation, we actually, uh, you know, we had to come up with all these brands and release them prior to uh, the day two years ago, whatever it was. And we did release a 60, a Mach 60, so we'd have it so that it would be substantially equivalent and blah, 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 blah. And so it's protected. So, yes, we did protect the 60. Good. But we're going to focus right now uh, on the quarter century. Absolutely. And, and the other one that by popular demand, the most requested cigar we've had in, in five years has been our winter collection. Oh, so yeah. We're launching the winter collection also this summer. The winter blend? Yeah, the winter blend. It was, oh. uh, it was a hot brand. We ran out of the tobaccos and finally we've saved enough over time and uh, we're getting ready to re uh, release those uh, that, that blend this summer also. I, I promise to sell it very hard for you, Rocky. 
right. Well, Rob, that's easy for you because the winter blend was a great blend. You're not going to have to try that hard. So yeah, I know. that was my point, Steve. You, you, you got you got 40 some other blends you got to really work hard on. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to back this up. I'm never going to let you live that down, by the way. Um, when you guys are looking at things, you know, again, what, what the hell is I thinking being the topic here? Do you guys find that you you do going back to some of the things we were talking about is, you know, Rocky and Rob, I mean, who's who's the bigger motivator, you know, yourself or others? Oh, for, for me, for me, it's myself for sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah I, I agree with that. You know, I, uh, I, I, I always try to challenge myself. You know, I, I always want to, you know, I've always had that kind of inner thinking kind of thing. You know, I reflect on my life on this decision or that decision. You know, look back at you know points in my life on what was making me happy then, and you know how to better incorporate those happy points into my life now, and and you know, to continue that growth. So, you know, it, it's obviously I've, I've got a lot of great role models. I'm very lucky. You know, I, every time, you know, people talk to me, of course, when I'm on the podcast, y'all hear me talk about my family and I always do it because I'm truly blessed with an amazing family. Yeah. And, uh, I'm moving back and smoke. My battery's recharged. So All right. Perfect. So, you know, I've got great role models and, and again, I'm, I, I don't say it because the guy's on here, but I do. I, I genuinely, you know, love and respect the man that I work for. And, and it is, it helps, you know, when you have someone like right. Rocky Bell, um leading, you know, the company and, you know, and, 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 you know, the rest of the guys with, with Nish and, and, and Nimish and, and Dave and, and, you know, the examples that they set, you know, it, it makes it, it makes it easier for us reps on the road. Um, you know, when, when they do the stuff that they do for us on a daily, you know, Rocky, obviously, with all his time on the road when he started out, you know, he knows, you know, the difficulties of being on the road and uh, what that hotel life is like. And, you know, Rocky, when he started, you know, he's sleeping on people's couches, you know, all, all the time. And, you know, he, he makes sure we're always staying in, in nice places and, you know, and, and are as comfortable as we possibly can be as we do it. So, you know, me. Personally, I, I'm very thankful for that, and and that helps motivate me as well. So, yeah. and Rocky, you said you're your your biggest self motivator back. I mean, you're that's that's it. Yeah, I mean, listen, I you know, it's it's. I mean, yeah, there are people I admire out there. Don't get me wrong. I mean, uh, you know, I I do have a lot of people I look up to. At the same time, you learn from every day. You learn. For me, I've learned more from my mistakes than I've learned from anything else in life. And so, you know, this entire business or any business is a learning curve. And every day I learn and, and, and there's never something that you can never be happy with because uh, life is challenging and there's so much to learn from life. And, and so I, I look at that and you try to incorporate as much of that in your life as possible. But the fear is what motivates me to be a better person and then uh, a more successful business person and make good decisions. So as you grow older too, hopefully you make wiser decisions, smarter decisions. And most of those decisions come from having made mistakes. Yeah. And so, you know, that, that can help guide you in life. You guys find any, any point where, you know, again, I, I like to, to focus on when things are going well, especially these days, you know, you know, d does it ever keep you up at night, th those failures, or, or can you not turn your brain off? I, I feel like both of you guys are a little bit of that person where it's tough to shut your brain off. Yeah, very much. I, I can't turn my brain off. No. It's, a, it's very active. I've tried to meditate. I've tried. I have some family members who are big time into meditation. I've tried that till I fell asleep. But uh, no, I can't do it. My mind is way too active. Uh, at the same time, Having said that, I don't sit there all night long and dwell on all the problems and mistakes and everything else. You, you got to be able to shut that off and then wake up and conquer one at a time and deal with everything. If you try to overwhelm and handle the entire basket in one opportunity, you're never going to succeed. So you got to tackle each issue. Each issue has different challenges. It has different ways to solve the problems. Uh, there's not one medicine for all problems. And so you, you just have to tackle each one individually, find the time. And at the same time, uh, I certainly 
as most people know, enjoy life and try to make the best out of life. Yeah. And, and, you know, I'm not one to sit there. Um, I'm, I'm always typically happy, uh, typically having a good time. And, uh, you know, try to make I, I think that shows in a lot of the, the efforts you've done, obviously, with, with your business. And, and there's a couple people on here that, that uh, are part of the company. And, and you know, it's like uh, Sean, who was, you brought up earlier, all of us that work for Rocky know how blessed we are. I mean, it, it shows. I mean, you live your life a certain way. And, it, you know, one of the things I like about that is, you know, you, you took a transition, Rocky, from industry to another industry. But then there was that jumping off point that you you talked about earlier where every, everyone thought you were crazy getting into the cigar industry. And then they thought you were crazy again. Even your closest people, family, friends, everyone like you're going to put your name on a cigar. Who cares about that? But, you know, fast forward all through these these ups and downs and, and a lot of ups, Hope you know, as we can see. But now it's 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 the lifestyle. You know, you, you live your life the way you treat people and your products that you're putting out there. Not only the cigars, the accessories, the, the, the now the, the cigar bars and lounges. I mean, it's all an extension of that, which I think it is an appropriate name for your cigar brand is Rocky Patel. I mean, there's there's no other name that I think would as people get a chance to meet you. You know, it, it makes sense. And I, I like that about about that. I mean, it, it's something that if you put your name on it, it's not for, for personal credit. It is you are the brand. It, it's it's a big, bold move that not everyone has the the comfort level to do that because it's they're not always and not saying you're 100 percent, but not everyone's confident in who they are to a point that they would be able to boldly put their name on it and then build a brand no matter what the industry is based on that name and who you are as a person. Well, yeah, the brand absolutely reflects my image. I think my persona, um, you know, at the same time, like I mentioned, I really do enjoy life. I, I like my share of cocktails. I like my share of fun. But everything is in balance. You know, you can have a great time without being insulting, without being rude. you got to have some good values. Which, uh, I'm blessed to have a great family. They can still good values in me. And... Uh, you know, as long as you have those basic fundamental things that are very, very important, uh, you know, you can absolutely have a great time and enjoy life. But you, but you got to have boundaries. And, and you know, we certainly have ethical boundaries in business. We have ethical boundaries in life. And so, you know, that, that's very important. As long as you're not uh, being obnoxious and hurting somebody else and being offensive to somebody else. And like I said, we're on this planet for a very, very short time and uh, make the best of it and make the best of your friendships, make the best of your professional associates you're with, make the best of your family and, 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 and enjoy every single day. And this last two months should definitely instill those characters in everybody that's out there and, yeah. and do that within reason and, 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 and live life to the fullest. You know, I treat every day like Christmas and New Year's. I really do. The minute I wake up, I try to make the best out of every day that I have. Uh, and, and granted, we all have problems. I have a lot of problems that I deal with every single day, but I don't sit there and dwell on them. I, I move forward and, and deal with them and still try to make the best of it. No, absolutely. For both of you guys, you know, um, wh while we're, we're talking about this, you, you think about what the hell was I thinking? Well, give me, if you could, you know, because there's a lot of good takeaways from this conversation already, and I, I like that. But at what point do you think was maybe one of your most pivotal moments where you were either up against the wall or you look back at it now where you're like, what the hell was I thinking that, that put you in a good spot? Mine was, uh, I mean, unequivocally, the, um, the move to Chicago. When I moved to Chicago, it was the biggest leap I had ever made, you know, growing up Dayton, Ohio, you know, 27 years in that, uh, you know, that, that bubble, if you will, of, uh, you know, I had the comfort of, you know, family and friends and, and, and all the relationships that I had built, um, you know, jobs were never a concern, you know, housing, nothing, I had nothing to ever worry about. Um, and a company when I was in the automation industry had uh, just built a new office and they needed people. And I just, I mean, it, it was literally a, a split second decision that I sent in my resume, you know, and I, 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 I 
look back at that moment and, and that decision at that time of, you know, branching out, getting away from that comfort zone, you know, that I, I, I was yes. very blessed with. Um, and then when I moved up there, you know, I moved into this tiny little apartment outside of Chicago, you know, expensive as can be, not knowing, you know, but a couple people. And, you know, here I am. And even though I had the backing of good people, um, you know, I, I wanted to do it on my own. You know, it was very much that that growth moment for me of wanting to show that I can do this. You know, that that I don't I know I have people and I but I don't I don't need that because I am successful in my own right. And uh, and the growth of the 12 years that I spent there, you know, both personally and professionally, that was the biggest, biggest change that I, uh, of my life that I could ever reflect on. And I, I, I mean, I'm thankful to this day, you know, to come back to Ohio now and be closer to my friends and family. The person that I am, you know, today to, you know, that guy back then when I left is, you know, night and day. And uh, I, I would never trade that moment. You know, that, that was such a big catalyst to, you know, learning how to be successful, learning to, to have that drive to to want to do things and grow and, 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 and be better, you know, not better for anybody else but myself. Well, you challenge yourself. I mean, that that's the, the, the takeaway there for me is that you were in a comfort zone. If you would have stayed there, you you probably would have done well, but it, it would it wouldn't right. you know, your your history would not be the same, you know, story as, as, at this point. You know, challenging yeah. yourself, and we talked about that a lot this evening is is that the inner drive and to take yourself out of a comfort zone when things are going well is actually sometimes a bigger challenge. I feel like for people when they are leaving their their friends, their community, their family, their their everyday life that is comfortable and and good. But a lot of times that good is is OK. And I think that's where you, you you know, hearing that from you and knowing what I know about you, Rob, is that that's something that has transformed you into a probably a bigger and better man at this point, which is. And it's- the next challenge I see for him is going and becoming a great opera star. <laughs> and, you know, that's, that's something that the, the, the both of you together uh, <laughs> about going on tour and, and, and just being great opera singers and you know i I think that might be the next challenge that's a good challenge (laughs) rocky how about to you we can bring back for me it had the turning point had to be in uh 2001 yeah when we finally had the opportunity to get complete control of production and uh have the opportunity to launch the 1990 and the 1992 vintage Right. And uh, and then have our name on the cigar because we had complete control of the production, the quality, the strict quality controls, and all of that. So that that was a life game changer for us. No, oh, absolutely. I did have a question while we have you on here, Rocky. You, you talked about it earlier, but uh, Nate, who is uh, part of the podcast, he said, "When I hear about our fight with the FDA, I think of, of Rocky. What made Rocky be the face of the fight? Which I know you're not the only one, but you know you have a lot of people out there." you know, in the cigar industry. As it's, go ahead. Yeah, absolutely. Listen, it, again, it was a fear of what would happen to this industry that we've worked so hard to be and, and make successful, right? This industry has grown. It's a cottage industry. It's a, it's an industry that's a pure art form. It's a culture that's transcended over generations. Literally, by the time we plant a seedling in the ground, time you get a cigar in a box it takes four to five years. There's no industry like this where you smoke a cigar, you automatically make a friend. Uh, doesn't matter what race, what culture, what socioeconomic class, it brings people together. And what I saw uh, that was happening, and it started with S chip, and it's a children's mm-hmm. health care uh, tax that they were going to impose on the industry. It started with $10 a cigar, then they wanted $3 a cigar. And, and I saw that the big corporations uh, were pushing for this as a way of basically gaining competitive advantage. And so uh, I had no idea how to meet a congressman, no idea how to meet a senator. I literally went to the cafeteria, stood by a Coke machine at lunchtime, hoping to meet somebody. And the first person I met was Senator Harkin. And I said, Senator, 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 there's about 300,000 jobs, 50,000 jobs in this country, please. And through him, I got to meet Senator Reid and on and on and on. But the reality is a little bit of my law background and, and, and what we had worked so hard to build and preserve uh, as an industry 
I saw was going to completely be taken away from us. Right. And so mm -hmm. I just started going up there. I was very passionate about it. I said, I'm not going to let these guys take this away from us. It makes no common sense. There's no reason for a legal product that doesn't have youth access issues, that doesn't have any other things. Why should we be the ones that are going to be de facto prohibition? And so uh, uh, it's been a mission like anything else. When I take up something and de decide to do something, I want to win at it because it's the righteous thing and it's the right thing. And so it's one of those things that I'm hell bent on. And I want to get that monkey off the back on the entire industry and whatever it's going to take. And not only going to certainly going to benefit me, but it's going to benefit the entire industry. And I thought it was going to be the right thing for the industry to do. No, that's that's strong. I mean, there's obviously a lot of re reoccurring things in your life in this story that 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 really resonate with, I think, a lot of listeners, obviously, is that it's it's that drive. It's the you know the, the the option or the the threat of failure and things that you work hard for that that you're going to possibly lose if you just sit back and and let other things take the control you have to get in the game to actually make an impact if you want to do that if you if you want to let it fall into other people's hands you can do that you want to let your job your career your your personal life if you just let everyone else take control and you're along for the ride it is a very very I guess uh, more or less a, a it's a dismal ride. It, it, you have no control of your life. It's a helpless ride. And I, I feel like, you know, learning from from Rocky tonight and knowing what I know of Rob and, and even learning more tonight, I, I feel like that's that's my biggest takeaway is that you have to get in the game. You have to do it and, and get in control of what you can control in your life. Um, at this point, you know, Rob, you know, you know the drill here, Rocky, this is the point where we do closing remarks. So, um, I finished that special edition, which Rocky, that's a fantastic cigar. Uh, we appreciate, you know, you, you extending that uh, cigar to the tinderbox at Easton because there's a lot of uh, cigar smokers that I think that will absolutely enjoy that. It's in that, uh, that sampler, the, the stay at home sampler from tinderbox at Easton, as well as the box deal with 20% off. Uh, tell us a little bit before we do closing remarks, uh, Rocky, if you would, or Rob, if you'd rather, uh, tell us about that special edition cigar. So, you know, the special edition is a cigar that we wanted to make for the best retailers that really support the Rocky Patel brand throughout the country. Uh, we made a, a, a very small release of this cigar. It's a Habano wrapper from Ecuador. It's got mostly Nicaraguan tobaccos. The cigar is box pressed. It's medium body and flavor. Uh, it's very, very limited. Uh, thanks to Tinderbox and Easton for their support and carrying the cigar. Uh, you won't find the cigar at too many places. I think I got a 93 rating on it. Fantastic. Um, it's, a, it's, it's a great cigar. You'll enjoy it. And, and I'll just say this for my closing remarks. Please, yeah. Uh, you know, whatever you dream of, whatever you want, you got to work hard. You got to be persistent. You might not get it at first, but it will eventually hard work, sacrifice, will eventually get you to where you want to be. And go out there, dream big, think big, but work hard. And it doesn't come easy without sacrifice. And you've learned a lot over the last two months. Think back, figure out what's important. For each of us, it's different. And those are the important things. And never forget about family and friends and good health. So stay healthy, be safe, love you all, and hope to see you around. It's amazing. Rob, how about you? Right. I mean, it, it, it's hard to follow that because, uh, you know, I, I, I reiterate that sentiment, you know, it, during all this time that, you know, we're dealing with, you know, the craziness of the world and what's going on. It's, you know, it is a perfect time to reflect, you know, and, and bring back those values that we as a society have so uh, easily forgot, you know, the, 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 our, our families, our friendships, you know, the things that really matter. I mean, it's great to, it's great to get that good paycheck. It's great to have that nice house, that fancy car. I mean, those are all wonderful things that, that make, you know, going through life nice, but they're just things, you know, it, it's those relationships that we have, have, you know, have built with people, you know, the families that we have, the friendships that, that are families as well, extended families. And, and, you know, holding on to that stuff that, 
you know, makes us happy on a daily and, 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 and holding on to that. You know, when we do get back to our, our day to day, our, our, our nine to five, our, 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 you know, blood from a turnip type of lifestyles, you know, to, to hold, hearken back to this time where when we are trying to find stuff to lift our spirits as we are, you know, stuck at home on a daily and we're, we're looking for this or that to, to make our, ourselves happy, you know, on a daily. Uh, um, remember that as we go on, because that's the stuff that's going to keep, you know, you motivated for the future. You know, that's the stuff that's going to keep you grounded and, and, and keep your values in a good spot. So, yeah. That's yeah, why yeah. Robert, we're going to get your bicycle and trade it for your car so you can go from account to account in the bicycle and be healthy and be non-polluted. <laughs> there you go. There you go. You know, I'll, I'll just add this, you know, as we close out here is that, um, you know, I learned a lot from this this episode. And Rocky and Rob, I appreciate you both being a part of this. This, is, this has absolutely been a pleasure. And I think uh, I know I speak for myself, but also anyone else viewing this or, or listening to the audio on this. Uh, again, I think, you know, when we do, especially part two, you know, we learn a lot on part one. Part two, I think we learn even more sometimes about, you know, some takeaways that everyone can, can you know, as soon as you're done listening to this, you can apply some things. And you got some good people on here. You got a successful guy like Rocky Patel who has done uh, successful things and multiple things. And the drive has been there. And and Rob is, as well. You, you shared a lot that it, it's very interesting to me and, and powerful to me that you see guys that are doing well and you wonder sometimes, how did they get there? And I don't think people talk about that enough, but this is an extension of the cigar shop, the, the lounges, the, the hanging out in people's patios and garages and smoking and drinking. And by the end of the night, you, 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 you learn something from other people as, as soon as you talk to them. And I think that's something that's coming out of, of this COVID-19 situation that we're in is that we enter back into this world. If you find yourself getting to a point in the day to day, you have a good job, you got a good family, but you're looking constantly for that moment where you're just not at your job. You find that moment where you just want to get to the cigar shop. You find that moment you just want to get away and you're just looking for that five o'clock hour on the job or whatever it is. You're constantly looking at the clock and you're just looking for your escapes. That's the moment that this will be the what the hell was I thinking type thing where if things are going well, things are going bad. There has to be a pivotal point, whether it's large or small, that I think that will will impact your life. And whether or not you believe it or not, not only will it impact your life, but like I was saying with Rob, it'll you'll be a better man or woman that the people around you will benefit so much more. And I think that's the most fulfilling part of all of this is that not only will your life feel better on a day-to-day basis. You want to get out of bed because you're ready to go do what you do for a living. You're ready to to go to do the escapes, but they're not escapes. It's just something that you enjoy. It's not getting away to go do your hobby because every other waking hour you're you're working at a job that's a dead end job or you're not happy, you're not fulfilled. I think these are the things that that are that are moments in people's lives that you can actually build off of when things are going well, especially challenge yourself. Don't rest on the laurels. Don't wait for the next paycheck. Don't work just for money. Make sure you're rewarding yourself because that is the point where, again, other people around you, whether you know them or not, but especially your inner circle, whether it be your friends, family, your kids, the people that work with you or for you, that will actually benefit more. And then it's just exponential. It builds on itself. And then you'll have more success and more people will have success doing these things because they'll learn from you be a leader and i think that's what i learned a lot tonight talking to rocky especially rob i know you've been on the podcast before and i've learned a lot from you over the last several years but rocky having this opportunity to have you on this podcast i hope that everyone got as much as i did from this hearing from someone that has had experiences and one of the things that i took away most from this rocky was that you kept hitting especially towards this this second half is that everyone has their ups and downs. Everyone has their trials and tribulations. The grass is always greener. Even if you see that person, their grass is greener, they're thinking the same thing. But the biggest motivator has to be yourself because if you're just looking outward, you will never measure up. You'll never match it. And you will be shooting for an unrealistic goal because then you'll just be looking to try to match up with someone else. Make yourself happy so that you can make other people happy. Guys, 
I, I want to thank you again. Okay. And I want to thank our sponsors, Tinderbox at Easton, Altidus USA, BS Cigar Company, and Rocky Patel Cigars for being a part of this. Guys, take advantage of the sales at Tinderbox at Easton. This isn't just a selling point. Everyone, again, at this point, coming out of this, we still have time. Treat yourself. Take advantage of these deals. You've got a great seven-pack sampler at Tinderbox at Easton. Uh, they've done a great job with Rocky. Rob, you you helped us out with this. And I, and and contrary to what Rocky may say, I think you're doing a fine job, sir. Uh, but you can always do better. Challenge yourself. Going back back to the topic, challenge yourself. And uh, everyone will, will gain from that. So, guys, thank you very much. Uh, and, and cheers. Cheers. Salute. Thank you. Be safe. Be healthy. Rob, thank you very much. Cheers, guys.